and overregulation. I've heard the concerns directly from my constituents in Oklahoma. The last thing uh, people want is the heavy hand of the federal government uh, burdening their families and businesses. It, the Biden administration has failed to take note. In their zeal to force their progressive vision onto the nation, Democrats have produced egregious regulation after regulation. It's time to end this abuse of regulatory power. Today, the Rules Committee is pushing back against unnecessary and burdensome executive agency overreach with four measures. The first I'll discuss is H.R. 288, the regulations from the executive in need of scrutiny, or RAINS Act. The RAINS Act will require congressional approval for any major rule or regulation that has an economic impact of $100 million or more annually. The Constitution articulates where the laws are made. It's here in Congress. Yet in recent years, the executive departments and agencies have largely seized the role of legislating by imposing new rules and regulations which have the force of law at a record rate. It's time to return power to Congress, which, unlike Washington bureaucrats, is accountable to the electorate. The RAINS Act will do just that. By requiring Congress to affirmatively approve every major rule or regulation that administration issues, the bill will restore accountability and our legislative authority. It strengthens the checks and balances system on the executive branch and curbs unelected federal employees from having unfettered power. Our second item, H.R. 288, is the Separation of Powers Restoration Act. The bill amends existing law to charge the scope, or excuse me, to change the scope of judicial review of agency actions. At present, courts generally follow the so-called Chevron deference, which requires uh, courts to defer to an agency's interpretation of a statute when reviewing an agency action like a regulation or rule. This gives the Washington bureaucrats undue power at the expense of congressional intent. If the agency's interpretations of the law is obviously incorrect, it still stands. SOPRA will change that. It will require the courts to review all issues from, begin from the beginning, including the, an appropriate review as to what the law says without putting a thumb on the scale in favor of the agency. Finally, our third and fourth items, H.R. 1615 and H.R. 1640, push back on the Biden administration's efforts to dictate what types of stoves Americans cook on. That's right. The White House wants to limit your ability to purchase and use gas stoves. Natural gas is a key part of Oklahoma's economy. Nationally, we are the fifth largest producer of natural gas, and we export two-thirds of what we produce out of the state. Oklahomans are proud to be part of our American energy dominance. Natural gas is used to heat just over half the homes in my state, and just over a third of Oklahoma residents use a gas stove to cook at home. My constituents are right to worry about the Biden administration's efforts to limit access to gas stoves. It's why the House is advancing these two measures today that will restrict the administration's ability to do so. H.R. 1640 will prevent the Department of Energy from finalizing a proposed regulation that will effectively ban half of the existing gas stoves on the market and will increase the price of the few options that would remain. And H.R. 1615 uh, will prohibit the Consumer Product Safety Commission from regulating gas stoves as a banned hazardous product or enforcing a product safety standard that bans gas stoves or substantially increases their price. I'm sure my friends in the minority will dismiss these two bills as addressing a petty concern, but it's not a petty concern to the hardworking Americans who will be impacted. As Americans already suffer under the rampant inflation thanks to Democrats' out-of-control spending, the last thing they need is to have the Biden administration's Green New Deal regulatory assault reach their kitchen appliances. House Republicans are committed to putting the people first and implementing pro-growth policies that unleash opportunity and our economy. Cutting the burdensome agency rules and halting the Biden administration's progressive regulatory agenda is a critical step in that commitment to America. I now yield to my very good friend, the gentlelady from uh, Pennsylvania, for any remarks she wishes to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the majority once again prioritizes right-wing culture wars over the American people by bringing misguided legislation that would prevent the federal government from issuing regulations needed to implement congressional legislation. 
to protect and defend our nation and the American people in the modern world. My colleagues are using bills as scare tactics to try and convince people that the federal, federal rulemaking process is something to fear, while failing to acknowledge that federal regulations are an essential part of ensuring that Americans have things like clean air to breathe and water to drink, safe food to eat, safe airplanes to fly on. You can see su examples of successful rulemaking all the time across the country. Before the Clean Water Act, the Delaware River, which runs alongside my district, was so polluted that it would strip the paint off passing ships. These days, you can safely kayak on the river thanks to regulations developed by agencies to carry out our laws. I'll also point out we're not talking about good faith efforts to provide checks on the regulatory process. My colleagues are ignoring the fact that Congress already has multiple tools to shape agency rulemaking, starting with the legislation we pass and moving all the way through repealing <coughs> regulations that they don't like. And they've employed these measures many times so far this Congress. But H.R. 277, the RAINS Act, which is the centerpiece of today's rule, does nothing but bring government operations to a grinding halt. And that seems to be exactly the point. There's also a possibility that the bill is unconstitutional because it creates a mechanism in which one House of Congress can effectively veto an agency's rule by simply not acting on it within a 70-day legislative time frame. This makes it indistinguishable from the one House legislative veto that the Supreme Court held to be unconstitutional in Immigration and Naturalization Service versus Chadha. The unfortunate truth is Congress struggles every day to meet the most pressing needs of the American people. There are not enough hours in the day, year, or two-year congressional term for us to weigh in on all the regulations needed to implement the laws that we passed, and they are much better left to experts in most cases. Under this policy, crucial regulations would be left to languish, unacted upon, and as a result, Americans would be less safe. The next bill, H.R. 288, the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, is another misguided approach to the issues facing federal regulations and rulemaking. It eliminates a decades-long ruling precedent for judicial review of agency decisions in a way that increases the risk of judicial activism, slows the rulemaking process, and skews that rulemaking process towards more powerful litigants. It's clear that all the talk on the other side of the aisle about restoring power to Congress is empty words. They have this power. They just have chosen not to exercise it. Because this bill would actually incentivize unelected judges, not Congress, to make and enact policy from the bench, it is equally as misguided as the Reins rule. And it would make the rulemaking process even more time consuming and costly, leading to delays in finalizing critical and even life-saving regulations. So with all of the issues concerning the American people, gun violence, opioid and fentanyl abuse, unaffordable health care, child care, the challenges of China and AI in a 21st century economy, these are the bills that our, our colleagues are choosing to bring up. H.R. 1615, the Gas Stove <coughs> Protection and Freedom Act, and H.R. 1640, the Save Our Stoves Act. These two bills work against requirements to ensure that newly manufactured gas stoves are healthy, safe, and energy efficient. H.R. 1615 threatens the government's ability to identify and regulate unsafe gas stoves, including those with design defects that could cause injury or death to American consumers. Had this bill been in effect last year, it would have prevented the Consumer Protection Safety Commission from issuing a recall on the type of gas stove that put people at serious risk of illness or death from carbon monoxide poisoning. People went to the hospital because this stove was defective. H.R. 1640 nullifies new congressionally mandated energy efficiency standards for gas stoves that would save consumers $1.7 billion in energy bills and cut down on emissions that are particularly dangerous to children's health. The Department of Energy estimates that nearly half of the gas stove market already meets the proposed standard and would not be impacted, and the remainder have years in which to comply. Contrary to the rhetoric out there, the government is not coming for anybody's gas stoves. It's a pervasive falsehood that's been repeated for months to stoke grievances without any truth to back up these claims, and now it's being used to press this legislation in Congress. 
It's abundantly clear that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle don't want our government to work better. They'd rather decimate a regulatory process that improves the lives of Americans every single day and use fossil fuel industry talking points to block common sense rules like the one that would lower energy bills for our constituents and protect children from harmful indoor pollution that puts their health at risk. They want to pr promote a dangerous vision of America that includes an FDA that can't issue new drug regulations, an EPA that can't keep drinking water clean, a VA that is unable to effectively provide services to our veterans, and a Department of Transportation that is not going to be able to effectively enforce safety standards for cars, trains, or airplanes. I think that we as the federal government need to take more responsibility for the health, safety, and welfare of our districts and our constituents than to throw it all under a bus with these rules. I yield back. Without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses may have will be included in the record. I'd like to welcome our, our first panel, Representative uh, Herod Hegeman and Representative Hank Johnson from the Committee on the Judiciary. Representative Hegeman, welcome. I think this is your first time before the Rules Committee, so we're delighted to have you here. And uh, you're uh, recognized uh, to deliver your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The power of the administrative state to impose radical and unpopular policies that could never be passed by Congress violates the separation of powers established by the Constitution and is a failed business model for running a country. The two bills that I am here to discuss today will help restore Congress's legislative primacy, increase the accountability of policymakers to the American people, and rein in the administrative state. Neither of these bills should be controversial. The first is H.R. 277, the Regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act, also known as the RAINS Act. This bill is extremely important to Congress reclaiming its rightful authority and responsibility to legislate. I therefore think it is important that we focus on the purpose of the bill rather than on extraneous matters that are more politically motivated than policy oriented. According to Section 2, titled Purpose, the purpose of this act is to increase accountability for and transparency in the federal regulatory process. Section 1 of Article 1 of the United States Constitution grants all legislative powers to Congress. Over time, however, Congress has excessively, and I would argue unlawfully, delegated its unconstitutional charge while failing to conduct appropriate oversight and retain accountability for the content of the laws that it passes. By requiring a vote in Congress, the RAINS Act will result in more carefully drafted and detailed legislation and improve regulatory process and a legislative branch that is truly accountable to the American people for the laws imposed upon them. Now again, what I can't figure out is why anyone would oppose this. The RAINS Act is drafted to address what is often re referred to as the non-delegation doctrine, which is a judicially created concept that has resulted in a dramatic shift in power and accountability from the legislative branch to the executive branch. The non-delegation doctrine is what has justified moving regulatory power from Congress to the agencies. It is what has allowed regulatory agencies to adopt regulations and even guidance documents that may impose economic costs in the billions of dollars on certain industries and businesses and ultimately on the American people without any congressional oversight or involvement at all. The current state of affairs, in other words, has empowered unelected bureaucrats to legislate without any accountability whatsoever and allowed members of Congress to abdicate the most important power they have, the power to write the laws. Not only is this bad policy, but it violates Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution, which reads, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. So what does the RAINS Act actually do? The RAINS Act requires Congress to affirmatively approve major rules, including those agency rules with an annual effect on the economy of at least $100 million before they can become effective. Prior legislative attempts to rein in the administrative state have been insufficient. For example, in 1996, Congress passed the Congressional Review Act, or as it is better known, the CRA. The CRA provided Congress with a legislative veto mechanism over agency rulemaking, 
allowing Congress to disapprove of the agency rules within a prescribed period of time after its issuance. However, the CA CRA has been used to overturn only 20 rules to date, not because Congress hasn't tried, but as with the current administration, we are met with a presidential veto when we move to do, to do so. As an example, just in the 118th Congress, both the House and the Senate passed legislation to overturn the unlawful WOTUS rule as issued by the EPA, to overturn the tariff repeal on solar panels made in China, and to overturn the radical ESG requirements issued by federal agencies. Yet each of those times, the President of the United States vetoed the actions of the House of Representatives and the Senate. And for example, in 2021, Congress passed just 143 laws, while federal agencies issued 3,257 rules. So when we hear the argument that Congress simply does not have the time to address these matters or to oversee rules that would have an effect of over $100 million, the argument just simply is untrue. We just need to do our jobs. The RAINS Act would help to remedy these problems. It would invert the CRA's standard of legislative disapproval in favor of requiring affirmative congressional approval of major agency rules before they take effect. It requires Congress to do uh, uh, as our, con our founding fathers expected and to carry out our constitutional duties, which is to legislate. The RAINS, Act puts, the RAINS Act puts legislative power back in the hands of the legislative branch, which is Congress. The RAINS Act also promotes electoral accountability by giving elected representatives a larger role in policymaking and unaccountable bureaucrats a smaller one. Again, I cannot fathom why anyone on the legisl legislative side of the aisle would oppose such accountability or such course correction of this legislative ship. The second bill I'm here to discuss is H.R. 288, the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, or SOPRA. SOPRA amends Section 706 of the Administrative Procedure Act. And as amended, Section 706 would read as follows. To the extent necessary to decision and when presented, the reviewing court shall determine the meaning or applicability of the terms of an agency action and decide de novo all relevant questions of law, including the interpretation of constitutional and statutory provisions and rules made by agencies. Very simple. Again, I cannot understand why anyone would oppose such a common sense requirement that our courts actually do their jobs, which is to interpret the law. SOPR requires nothing more to an, than to apply de novo review to all questions of law, including agencies' interpretations of statutes and rules. That's what courts are supposed to do under the Constitution, interpret the law. SOPRA would override the ill-advised Supreme Court precedents like Chevron USA Incorporated versus Natural Resources Defense Council that require courts to defer to agencies' interpretations of statutes and rules so long as they are reasonable, but not necessarily if they are correct. It would end this improper judicial deference that gives agencies greater leeway to pass rules carrying the force of law and which puts a thumb on the scale in favor of the administrative state and against the American people. By doing so, SOPRA would help to restore the constitutional separation of powers, reclaiming the court's role as the branch that interprets the law and Congress's role as the, bran the branch that makes the law. And it also would help to promote the electoral accountability of policymakers by ensuring that it is Congress's policies and not those of unelected bureaucrats that govern the American people. I was also asked to address or introduce my amendment to SOPRA at this time. I believe that SOPRA is a great bill, which I fully support. My amendment, however, is simple and simply clarifies that de novo judicial review would apply to agency guidance as well as to congressional statutes and agency rules. Specifically, my amendment explicitly states that interpretive rules, general statements of policy, and all other agency guidance are subject to de novo judicial review as well. Unlike rules, guidance is undefined in the APA's definition section. Agency guidance consists of interpretive rules that explain how agencies interpret the statutes and rules that they administer 
and general statements of policy that prospectively advise how agencies may choose to exercise their authority. Guidance, however, is not subject to the APA's notice and comment requirements, and at least officially, should not have the effect of law. Yet we have seen a growing trend of the administrative agencies attempting to use guidance to have the force of law while avoiding the APA process. For example, in my private capacity, capacity before being elected to Congress, I was part of an effort challenging the United States Department of Agriculture's efforts to force all of our livestock producers to use RFID ear tags at the cost of $2 billion to the industry. The agency tried to force this on our American farmers and ranchers and cattle producers through a two-page guidance document that was published on the USDA's website. They did this without any notice or an opportunity to be heard by the regulated industry. Further concerning is that guidance is often not judicially reviewable because agencies will then claim that it is not final agency action. And even when it is reviewed, the government then asks for deference to the agencies from the court. SOPR is a great bill. While it is implicit in the language that the requirement for de novo judicial review of all relevant questions of laws applies to agency guidance, my amendment would make this explicit. This bill is about reining in the administrative state and preventing it from abusing the federal government's power. My amendment would clarify that agency guidance, which the executive agencies routinely abuse, is subject to the standard of de novo judicial review under the bill. Thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much. The uh, chair will actually exercise his personal prerogative to announce the University of Oklahoma women's softball team just won their 51st consecutive record-setting game to advance to the finals of the NCAA uh, Women's uh, National Softball Championship. So they are the best. So <laughs> with that, thank you for your indulgence, uh, Representative Johnson. Welcome back to the Rules Committee. It, uh, you're recognized for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if And thank you, Ranking Member. Should, should I proceed with um, argument uh, on the uh, SOPRA legislation immediately after uh, uh, RAINS Act, or should I reserve that until such time as we take up uh, SOPRA? The gentleman's free to do whatever he cares to do, so certainly those, those remarks would be in order if you care to make them in addition to your opening statement. Okay. All right. I think what I'll do is just make an opening statement on, uh, on RAINS and then when we get to SOPRA, I'll deal with SOPRA. That, that'll be fine. Gentlemen's recognized to proceed. Thank you. Although I acknowledge that it's uh, certainly efficient to proceed as, uh, as the... Just uh, so the gentleman knows, we are covering them together, so it would be appropriate for you to go ahead okay. and add them to your remarks if you care to. Okay, thank you. And uh, I want to thank all of the committee... Okay. I want to thank all of the committee members... Uh, uh, along with uh, the chair and the ranking member for uh, affording me this opportunity to testify today. The RAINS Act and the Separation of, Powers, uh, Separation of Powers Restoration Act both represent efforts to dismantle and undermine the administrative process in different and dangerous ways that would frustrate the purpose of government and would put our constituents in harm's way. Now, this... Um, uh, is uh, in keeping with the mastermind of the MAGA movement, Steve Bannon, who, uh, when he first came to power, stated that his goal was to uh, destroy or deconstruct the administrative state. And that's exactly uh, what this legislation seeks to do. And I would point out that um, the purpose of government is different than the purpose of business. Business is to make a profit. Government uh, was established uh, to afford uh, mechanisms for justice, uh, to promote domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, and most importantly, to promote the general welfare. And that's what le legislative delegation to administrative agencies does. It promotes the general welfare. And it's, uh, it's not unconstitutional for Congress to so delegate. Uh, the RAINS Act is a huge expansion of the Congressional Review Act 
that requires both houses of Congress to vote and approve uh, and for the president to sign any major rule from the executive branch that is in progress. This would grind the gears of rulemaking to a, heart, a halt. Furthermore, by allowing a proposed regulation to be blocked from being finalized and implemented, if even one chamber declines to pass an approval resolution, uh, this means that the Reigns Act is essentially a legislative veto, which the Supreme Court has already held as unconstitutional. The goal of this legislation, quite simply, is to stop the regulatory process in its tracks, regardless of its impact on public health and safety. The bill purports to give Congress control of the rulemaking progress process, excuse me, but Congress already has that power, and it exercises it in a number of ways. First, Congress can delegate authority to agencies with specificity, thus limiting the scope of the agency's authority. Second, it can impose restrictions on rulemaking through appropriations. And third, it can influence rulemaking through oversight activities. And if all of these measures are insufficient, we also have the blunt tool of the Congressional Review Act, which allows Congress not only to overturn a rule, but also to bar the agency from ever passing a substantially similar rule. And the fact that uh, Congress has taken action only 20 times uh, under the Congressional Review Act is a testament to the, um, the validity and the virtue of the rules that uh, have been promulgated and implemented by federal agencies. And it also speaks to congressional inability to act uh, in a way that produces or repeals um, rules. Uh, congressional uh, molasses uh, is, is what uh, is perhaps responsible for only 20 times the Congress having acted under the Congressional Review Act. The Reigns Act is not only redundant but it also creates insurmountable procedural hurdles that would stall the approval of rules of major impact, rules that would be highly beneficial to the public's health and safety. It's important to remember that we have regulations in the first place. Congress sets broad policies, but we delegate authority to executive agencies because Congress does not have the expertise or the capacity to craft technical regulations themselves. And these regulations ensure that our air is safe to breathe, our water is safe to drink, our food is safe to eat, our flies, our skies are safe to fly in, and the life-saving medications we depend on are safe and effective. But supporters of the RAINS Act want to hamstring our agencies and undermine their ability to issue vital regulations. With regard to the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, or SOPRA, this act similarly would completely upend the administrative process, the goal of Steve Bannon and the MAGA crowd. It would do so by eliminating judicial deference to agencies and require federal courts to review all agency rulemakings and interpretations of statutes on a de novo basis. Judicial review of final agency action is a hallmark of administrative law and is critical to ensure that agency action does not harm or adversely affect the public. But as the Supreme Court held in Chevron v. Natural Resources Defense Council, reviewing courts may only invalidate an agency action when it violates a constitutional provision or when an, act, when an agency exceeds its statutory authority as clearly expressed by Congress. For decades, this seminal decision has required deference to the sub substantive expertise and political accountability of federal agencies. Judicial deference is born from principles of political accountability and separation of powers. 
As the court explained in Chevron, quote, federal judges who have no constituency have a duty to respect legitimate policy choices made by those who do. The responsibilities for assessing the wisdom of such policy choices and resolving the struggle between competing views of the public interest are not judicial ones. Our Constitution vests such responsibilities in the political branches, end quote. SOPRA would eliminate this longstanding and reasonable tradition of judicial deference to agencies' interpretation of statutes by, requir by requiring courts to review all agency interpretations of statutes and rules on a de novo basis, meaning that the court would have to decide after hearing evidence the merits of a particular code or rule. Now, I've already talked about the uh, molasses uh, process of the legislative branch. The judicial branch is even in worse shape due to congressional failure to expand the courts. Uh, we have the same, basically the same number of federal district court and court of appeals judgeships since 1990. There has not been a expansion of the federal judiciary since that time in a uh, meaningful way, which means that courts are overloaded with litigation, both criminal and civil. And to give them this responsibility just uh, gums up and totally stops the rulemaking process. SOPRA, SOPRA would uh, eliminate the longstanding tradition of judicial deference to agencies' interpretation of statutes by requiring courts to review agency interpretations, all agency interpretations, uh, on a de novo basis. This misguided legislation would make an already cumbersome process of agency rulemaking even more burdensome by requiring courts, which lack the, le the expertise that agencies do, to review the merits of each and every rule or code. This bill would lead, years, would lead to years of delay and untold costs and put our health, safety, and well-being at risk, which, of course, is the whole point. Republicans have spent decades waging an all-out assault on the regulatory process. It has intensified under MAGA Republican rule and trying to add hurdle after hurdle on the ability of agencies to issue regulations that protect public health and safety, regulations whose benefits consistently outweigh their cost, often by many multiples, is definitely misguided. Both the RAINS Act and SOPRA would further the agenda of the MAGA crowd by dismantling and destroying the regulatory process, regardless of the impact on public health and safety. I urge my colleagues to oppose both bills, and I'd like to uh, submit uh, an amendment uh, if I can pull it forward right now. Uh, an amendment to the RAINS Act, uh, which requires, uh, as I've stated, House and Senate approval plus a presidential signature before administrative rules can take effect. Uh, the majority claims that regulations kill jobs, but nothing could be further from the truth. As Bruce Bartlett, a senior policy analyst, in the Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush administrations has explained, quote, no hard evidence is offered for this claim. It is simply asserted as self-evident and repeated endlessly throughout the conservative echo chamber, end quote. That's the fact or the assertion that regulations kill jobs. If we really cared about American jobs, why would we make it more difficult to enact rules that would improve employment, retention, and wages? I offer this amendment because I believe that regulations meant to help unemployed Americans back to work should take effect without unreasonable or unnecessary to delay. And that is why I propose uh, an amendment that would exempt from the RAINS Act 
any rules that improve the employment, retention, and wages of workforce participants, especially uh, those with si significant barriers to em employment. And with that, I will uh, yield back. Thank you for your testimony. The chair remains uh, uh, too giddy uh, over the University of Oklahoma's triumph. <laughs> Uh, over a very worthy adversary in, San, in Stanford to uh, actually offer any questions. So I'm going to hold my questions, and uh, I'll go to the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania for any questions he might have for our panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate it, and congrats again on the win. Representative uh, Hageman, I have some questions on um, the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, if you don't mind. What is the resort, result when courts rely on agency interpretation of laws instead of the letter of the law? Well, what happens is it's, it's an unconstitutional putting a thumb on the scale from one party to the, to the lawsuit. So just from a very practical standpoint, you know, as a practitioner, as someone who's tried a lot of cases in federal court against federal agencies, I can tell you the practical effect is that when you go to the court, uh, the guy sitting in the black robe, Thank you. Um, because what they're saying is we're going to believe what the agency says here in terms of the interpretation rather than reading the language themselves. So what has happened since the, since the uh, Chevron decision was issued in the early 1980s is that the agencies have become much more powerful at the expense of the individuals and the businesses that, they, that they're regulating. So the practical effect is that the courts are abdicating their responsibility of determining what the law is, turning it over to the agencies, which are biased and, and, and have their own reason of why they want to interpret the laws and the regulations the way that they do. An example is uh, the recent WOTUS uh, 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 rule that has come out of this administration. It was just last week that the Supreme Court, in a 9-0 to zero decision, concluded that the, that the uh, WOTUS rule that... Uh, uh, is 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 the, applied to the sackets at the time was not based upon statute. That's an example of agencies overreaching, and then the courts, if they allow that to happen, it's just a travesty of justice. Some on the other side of the aisle have said that if this bill passes, goes into law, it's going to prevent agencies from exercising their so-called expertise. Would you like to talk about that and how... Um, that's not what this bill does? Well, it isn't what this bill does. And we're so often told that it's for the experts to be making these policy decisions. And that having Congress make the ultimate decision when it comes to, in, in this case, uh, the, the, the RAINS Act, making the ultimate decision when it comes to regulations that have an impact of over $100 million is unworkable. And that's just flat not true. For one thing, what people really need to understand is that the agency's expertise lies in the admi administrative process itself. They are, the, the Biden cabinet is just an example. There isn't a person in the Biden cabinet that has ever worked in the private sector, not one. Um, they aren't experts on farming or handling of li livestock or producing oil or managing grocery stores or cooking on gas stoves or ele versus electric stoves. They're not the ones who manage the wildlife even though we have a Fish and Wildlife Service. The Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't manage wildlife, the states do. Um, they don't manage water quantity or water quality. Again, the states do. So when they talk about expertise and why we have to defer to the experts, the reality is the regulations that they're adopting are inherently biased in and of themselves because they're political decisions. They're not based upon expertise. Thanks, and Representative Hageman, let's just talk about the RAINS Act briefly. My friends across the aisle are trying to say that the RAINS Act will, uh, they're arguing that it will harm public health. Is there any truth to that? No, again, what it is, is it's focused only on those regulations that have an impact, an economic impact of $100 million or more. So there's a huge swath of regulations. I would prefer to the, for that that number be lower because, again, I think that Congress ought to exercise its rightful responsibility to legislate. So that's one of the things is, is, is that... 
the, the, we have the statutes in place. Again, we have the Clean Air Act. We have the Clean Water Act. Those things are implemented right now, but they're not implemented by the EPA. Again, they're implemented by the states. They're implemented by the Department of Environmental Quality in Wyoming, for example. They're implemented by the municipalities, whether it's Rollins or Cheyenne or Gillette or Casper. That's how those the, the laws are implemented right now. The regulations, again, are a political statement and have become biased in and of themselves. So what I would argue is that what this bill will do is, number one, ensure that we are complying with the Constitution, but it also will ensure that the, the American public has a voice in what our laws are. Thank you, Representative Hageman. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for any questions she may care to address to our witnesses. Thank you. Um, I know there's been some discussion about focusing on the purpose of the RAINS Act to increase accountability and transparency in the regulatory process, but I find it very difficult to see that you can focus on the purpose without looking at the actual impact. And the fact of the matter is Congress has multiple opportunities for every regulation to influence those regulations, whether in um, the initial brief that's given to the regulatory agency with the legislation that's being implemented, or in the comment period, or in the opportunity with these regulations in the 60-day period that they cannot go into effect um, when Congress has the opportunity to take them down or thereafter, as we've seen a couple attempts already this Congress. So if Congress isn't uh, exercising its opportunity to be more impactful with respect to regulations, that's on Congress. And I don't see that flipping the entire system upside down and preventing any regulations from going into effect um, unless Congress, both houses and the president act, is going to help the situation. All it's going to do is block regulations from going into impact, going into effect. And those regulations are supposed to be implementing congressional purpose. So um, you've been here a little longer than I have. Um, can you speak to you know, the practical impact of the RAINS Act if Congress is going to have to basically legislate every regulation after it's already gone through the regulatory process. Yeah, I've been here now for, uh, this is my 17th year. It's gone by very quickly. <laughs> but during that time, I've seen things go from bad to worse in terms of congressional productivity. It took us 15 ballots to uh, elect a Speaker of the House in this 118th Congress. That is a clear example of the morass that Congress and the House of Representatives uh, uh, in this, in, in, in particular, uh, is steeped in. It prevents us from dealing with uh, needed uh, work. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we're now uh, dealing with or thinking about dealing with uh, artificial intelligence, which is already out of the box being implemented, and there's no uh, hope in sight that Congress will come up with legislative solutions to address what the experts have are employing, are imploring us mm -hmm. to address. And so without the prospects of doing that kind of work, and then Congress uh, taking on rulemaking, pretty much, uh, taking it away from the agencies and putting that responsibility solely on itself uh, just doesn't uh, make a lot of sense when you think about whether or not that's going to be effective or not mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for uh, the people that we represent. Now, it certainly will... Uh, increase the ability of uh, businesses to make money uh, by taking uh, regu regulations off the table, allowing them to do whatever they want to do, uh, regardless of whether or not it impacts health and safety and well-being of American people. Businesses will love that, uh, but it won't work for the people. Uh, what struck me, I think, in your testimony is you said that the the CRA process has been used a total of about 20 times to remove regulations. But we know that this RAINS Act would impact about 100 regulations a year. So if Congress, had, in the course of the entire CRA, has only been able to exercise its legislative ability over regulations a couple dozen times, and now all of a sudden it's going to have to do this you know, on 
a weekly basis, I think it's going to make a an already cumbersome legislative process even worse. You you mentioned well, an amendment. If I might yeah. add, four hundred and thirty four federal agencies engaged in the rulemaking process, and in twenty twenty two. 3,168 rules were uh, promulgated mm -hmm. uh, for Congress to take that kind of uh, uh, business uh, unto itself. It's, it's impossible that uh, Congress could be effective in rulemaking. Well, I, I know that Congress has delegated rulemaking responsibilities almost for the entire um, existence of our government, so it does seem like an effective delegation, and even more so now in the modern world when there's so many uh, different issues that we have to deal with. Um, you mentioned that you have interest in an amendment having to do with regulations impacting um, jobs. Can you talk about how those regulations impact Americans with respect to jobs? Well, uh, regulations like a 40-hour work week, like uh, protections for children, uh, child labor, um, like uh, workplace protections protecting uh, the health and safety of poultry plant workers or any other kind of plant. Uh, these uh, help people be able to go to work, make an honest day's living in a safe environment, in an environment that they can come back home to their children and their family in one piece. And so anytime we have regulations that impact the ability of people to go to work and return home safely, uh, my amendment would uh, exclude uh, from the provisions of the uh, uh, RAINS Act. Mm -hmm. And I, I know certainly the workplace is not a static environment as new inventions and new processes happen all the time. I know in recent years we've been looking at the need for increased OSHA regulations regarding heat and people working in extreme heat as that's become a bigger and bigger issue in our communities. Okay, thank you, and I would yield back. Thank you, gentlelady. The gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized for any questions she may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I may not actually have a question, but I do have some things I want to say about this because this, um, you know, we all know that rule writing and the regulations coming out of these agencies is out of control. It's out of control. What do you hear from constituents? They call it, when they call and complain about something happening and you dig into it, it's a rule. It's not, it's not something that Congress did, it's a rule. That's what the, and the constituent issues that you need to deal with and try to help them get through this and you try to figure out how to help them and it's a rule that has been put in place by unaccountable bureaucrats that have no idea of what's really happening on, on a farm or in a business in rural Minnesota, but they are able to put these rules in place, carrying the force of law that we haven't, that, that Congress has had no say in. And um, I think uh, Mr. Johnson mentioned that there was 3,168 rules, I believe, in 2020, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, I tried to write it down. But I'll tell you, in 2021, Congress passed 143 laws. The federal agencies that year put together 3,257 rules that carry the force of law. That now that someone in rural Minnesota, whether or it needs, it has to follow, whether or not that, that bureaucrat, unaccountable bureaucrat, had any idea of what the real impact of it was going to be. We have to be able, we have to, when we are creating these things, Congress has to have input. And, um, you know, um, Congresswoman Hageman, you said they're political. And I really think that's what we have right now, is we are, they, they are, because, um, in particular, because if something doesn't pass in Congress, then they just put it in rule and do it behind everybody's back, and, um, and it just becomes a mess, and these people are suffering, and you have a comment you'd like to make. Well, I, I think that, that you've just made it an extremely important point, which is what I was going to make earlier, which is the RAINS Act is regulatory neutral. It will apply to both Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. 
So it gets at the very political issue that you've said, but there are several other things that I think need to be clarified about this bill because I don't know if they haven't read it yet or, or don't understand the, the, the significance of what the RAINS Act says, but uh, there was a comment made that, we, that Congress has been delegating their, their authority since the beginning of our country, and that's really not true. This delegation concept is largely of a modern origin. Um, we didn't really have the regulatory state prior to the New Deal, in fact, so there weren't the agencies to delegate to. So that's one of the things that I think is very important is this has only been in the last 80 to 90 years that we've seen it. And I would argue, again, as a practitioner, that the last 30 years, there has been an enormous explosion in the number of rules. Another point that I think is very important is that when the folks on the other side talk about the RAINS Act, they act as though Congress would be reviewing every single regulation that is adopted, and that isn't the case. These are major regulations. Again, I'd like the number to be lower, but they are at $100 million. Going back to the information, in, in 2021, the Biden administration issued 3,257 rules. Only 300, not only, but, 387 or 12% were deemed significant. So the RAINS Act doesn't address 88% of the regulations that, that came out of the Biden administration in 2021 alone. I don't anticipate those numbers to change dramatically. Uh, again, I think 100 million is, is too high of a number, but setting that aside, I think another important point to make, and this again is from someone who's actually been out in the field and seen how these regulations are, are, are enforced, the larger the rule, the more damage they can cause, the more unintended consequences we suffer from. And I'm gonna give, give you an example of this. In 2001, under the Clinton administration, very, one of the very last things that they did on the way out the door was adopt the roadless rule. The roadless rule denied access management and use to 58.5 million acres of National Forest Service lands. That was a regulation. That was not legislation mm -hmm. coming out of this body. That was a regulation that denied access management and use to one third of our National Forest. We have 192 million acres in our National Forest Service. And that was almost a third. And what have we seen in the last 20 years? And it's not because of climate change or global warming. It is because of a failure of our Forest Service to be able to manage our resources. We've seen a huge increase in catastrophic forest fires. We've seen a devastation of our national forests because of the pine beetle outbreak, which they knew about at the time that they adopted the roadless rule. The larger the rule, the more damage it can cause. That is another reason, not just from an economic standpoint that we ought to be looking at rules of $100 million, but why in the world would we want an agency to be able to adopt a regulation that has that kind of an economic impact on this country and have no legislative oversight at all? Thank you very much. And I, I just, I will, uh, I will just say one more thing. The, un the unaccountability, there's just no accountability on these rules, and um, and you're so right. I mean, they are so damaging, and the, the folks that are writing these either don't care or don't understand or just, just want to produce rules because they are not doing any good in all of the, in particular, you know, in a rural area, and, uh, and they're regulating farms, they're regulating all kinds of things that they have no business regulating. Thank you. Um, but uh, with that, I yield back. Oh, you're the chair. Look at you. There. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. It's my understanding that the gentlelady from New Mexico and the gentleman from Kentucky would like to hear more of the testimony before asking questions. Is that correct? Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Recognize the gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, Ms. Hagman, thank you for your uh, testimony. You know, it's one big disappointment uh, <clears throat> on our debt ceiling negotiations was taking reins out and put, put in PAYGO, which OMB can pretty much dismantle at any, uh, at the whim of, of whatever they think. But no, I, <clears throat> this is common sense to me. Uh, the unelected bureaucrats that Ms. Uh, Fishback talked about, uh, it's like <clears throat> they make political decisions. Uh, the, the issues we face now coming from this administration, 
you really want to help the people get rid of some of these regulations. Reins Act has some accountability to it, and I, I applaud you for doing it. You know, government doesn't create jobs. It's, uh, it's far too expansive the way it is now, and this administration has gone wild with it. So I applaud you for doing this. Thank you for your explanation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Thank you. With that, the gentlelady from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative uh, Johnson, Rep Representative Hageman, for coming and testifying today. Um, Representative Johnson, you know, I am sometimes taken back by, I'm looking at these bills, and, and we often hear from the other side of the aisle about the fact that we have too much layers, too many layers, too much bureaucracy, too many hindrances to actually get what's needed to be done, done, right? And every time you add a layer, it strikes me that we're also adding both delay and cost. Can you talk about whether these bills would indeed cost the taxpayers more money uh, for us to actually just have the federal agencies implement the laws that we have passed? Well, it would certainly um, result in um, more money uh, flowing from corporations to white shoe silk stocking law firms uh, to uh, uh, to have de novo reviews in court of agency rulemaking decisions. So, and that would mean more costs to consumers uh, ultimately. But it also would uh, add to less consumer protection, and um, it would actually uh, lead to less regulations and really gum up the work so that there would be no regulations. The total deconstruction of the administrative state is the stated goal of the MAGA Republicans. And this is a step in that direction. And so uh, with, if, if this should pass, then look for additional laws that would further gum up the uh, regulatory process. And it would have nothing other than, uh, it would do nothing other than to increase cost, lessen safety. Uh, it would hurt consumers of America to go down this road. Right, and thank you very much for highlighting the greater role that would be given to uh, uh, the wealthy and their ability to, as you say, hire uh, a high-priced attorneys to go and gum up the system, uh, because that would actually take it away from the administrative process where in the administrative process, they're required to take testimony from the public. And so it's not hard to provide that testimony during the Administrative Pro Pro Procedures Act because you send it in, you show up at hearings, you do not need to be represented uh, when you are giving testimony uh, for regulation. Is that right, Mr. Well, Representative Johnson? Well, since 1946, uh, the Administrative Procedures Act passed by Congress, a comprehensive framework for uh, the issuance, modification, and repeal of rules has been in place and has been subjected to uh, court review. Case law has developed. And uh, it is a uh, area of law that has worked. Um, and now we get those who want to do away with uh, the Administrative Procedures Act so as to do away with uh, regulation, period. That's where we are in this country, a, a country with uh, no rules, only the strong survive, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the middle class shrinks, and we got children going to work, working 14 hours a day without public schools to attend. Uh, that's uh, where folks want to take us back to as they take away individual liberties through the courts while awarding greater rights to corporations. And so this is a step in, in that direction, this deregulatory approach and trying to take us back to a time when uh, Americans were working 14-hour days and getting their uh, arms and fingers and hands cut off and legs amputated because of unsafe working conditions and, uh, you know, no minimum uh, 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 occupation laws uh, in terms of hours worked, uh, safety, 
that kind of thing. We, this country was in such a period, but uh, thankfully, uh, back in 1946, when the Administrative Procedures Act was uh, implemented, uh, it heralded, heralded in a new era uh, of uh, the growth of America, not just the growth of wealthy industrialists, but the growth of the middle class in America. And so this is an, a, really an attack on the middle class. Right, it's an, it's an attack on the role that government has, and we passed the laws. We've already been involved in the process. It's not like Congress hasn't been involved in the process. We have passed the laws, and then we expect the, uh, the, the administration to implement those laws. And we already have, and we, we already have a process for Congress to actually overturn something that the administration does when we don't think it's right. And in, indeed, this Congress uh, it has already done that numerous times, historic highs in which this Congress has used the CRA. Uh, and I, I really, you know, I'm struck by the Separation of Powers Restoration Act. It's going to be giving enormous power to the judiciary right now at a time when Americans have lost their faith in, judici in the judicial branch, especially because of the extreme and partisan decisions of the Supreme Court and of the attitude that we have in somebody like Justice uh, Thomas, who has been taking vacations worth half a million dollars from a billionaire. That same billionaire has bought a house for his mom, paid for uh, relatives, a, a nephew's, a great nephew's college. There has been an erosion of faith in the courts precisely because at the Supreme Court level, they are not holding themselves to the higher standard they need. So there is, by removing these and putting it over in the courts, you are actually removing it from the people. You are, you are restricting access. You are restricting liberty. You are restricting the freedom that you have just described that has worked so well for 80 years as we, as we have advanced. I mean, I was over uh, along the Ohio River for a graduation uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, and it was like people were telling me about what it was like when that was so polluted and, and the fish were dying. And, you know, we've had rivers that have caught fire. Uh, and thanks to regulation, thanks to two things, Congress has passed the law, and then we have designated who is going to implement it. So uh, we know that uh, right now Americans are simply losing their confidence. Only in 22, only 18% of Americans said they have a great deal of confidence in the court. And then with the latest revelations uh, regarding Justice Tom Thomas, it's even gone lower. So I think that uh, we need to maintain the Administrative Procedures Act, maintain the process that is already in place for Congress to act when, uh, when we believe that uh, an administrative procedure rule should not be implemented. And uh, thank you so much for appearing and clarifying that history, that history that's so important of how it's through regulation of the laws we've implemented that we have actually cleaned up our rivers. We've, you know, made such advances and protected those against child, lab uh, child labor. And, and then when they don't do it, we can call them in in our oversight uh, role and hold them accountable, isn't that right? That, that's correct, and I, I heard a comment during this hearing that um, the guys in the black robes uh, don't care, excuse me, uh, the guys in the black robe is on the other side of the team, is what was said, uh, when regulations get challenged in court under current practice. Uh, the comment was made that the guy in the black robe, or in other words, the judge, uh, is on the other side of the team. But nothing could be further from the truth. The courts have been captured by the corporate interests, particularly the uh, United States Supreme Court. But the higher you go, the greater the capture. And, um, and the, the problem is that when you start having de novo reviews of agency, uh, agency rulemaking uh, in the courts, then you are kicking it to a situation where the Federalist Society has planted uh, judges and justices into position to rule uh, in favor of the corporate interest. And so uh, 
the handwriting is on the wall in terms of uh, SOPRA and range. Thank you, uh, Rank um, uh, I mean, Representative Johnson, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when we debated this in the committee, it seemed like the major objection to this bill from the other side of the aisle was that it took power away from the executive branch and gave it to the legislative branch, that the RAINS Act, that that was its major defect. I think that's its major attribute. I mean, uh, when we say executive branch, it's not the president who writes these rules that have the force of law. It's, it's career bureaucrats who are writing these things. And uh, then they have the force of law, and they can carry prison terms, as we see with the pistol brace rule. There can be prison terms attached to these. These are effectively law. Um, but why would we be here in this body arguing that we should have less power? I mean, we've already, our power's atrophied uh, considerably since the founding of this country. Uh, one of the objections, one of the specific objections I heard, though, was that uh, the experts would no longer be involved and that we, we didn't possess the knowledge required to, to make these rules that the legislative branch is making. Uh, Representative Hagman, do you want to uh, address that? Would experts still be involved in lawmaking? Would they have no say whatsoever? I, I would, in fact, argue they would have more say now because we would be talking to our constituents the ones that have the expertise in their particular areas, uh, whether it's business or providing medical care or whatever that might be. I'd like to read a paragraph that goes directly to that issue that it was written by Philip Hamburger. Philip Hamburger is considered perhaps the foremost expert on administrative law in the United States. And he has read, written something about this whole delegation issue that I think is extremely important for everyone to understand. It's easy to talk about cutting off of fingers and toes in some kind of a dystopian world that we're going to live in if Congress actually does its job. And it's easy to say things like that, but it's not reality. It's not reality, not just because the experts would still be involved, but it's not reality because it's not the way our country operates. But I'll just read this real quickly. Uh, in, in addressing this issue of expertise, the result is different from the administrative st state, but not as severe uh, as might be supposed, it is often feared that a barrier to the delegation of legislative power would require Congress to make all rules and would bar any ag agency discretion. But nothing in the Constitution is so rigid. Instead, the Constitution confines binding agency rules to Congress and binding adjudications to the courts while leaving room for a wide range of other agency rules and adjudications. Even as to binding rules, the Constitution would require little change in their framing or formulation. Agencies still could frame rules very much akin to current agencies. The only difference would be that whereas now binding rules can be adopted by heads of agencies, a more constitutional approach would require agencies to send such rules to Congress to enact. And again, we're talking about 12, a 12% 12 subset of that. We're talking about only the major rules. So again, I'd like the number to be lower, but at 100 million in 2021, 12% of the Biden administration's rules would consider major rules subject to this piece of, uh, to the RAINS Act. So again, I'm with you. I think we ought to do our job. I think we are the experts. We have the ability to bring in any experts that we want to on a particular topic. The agencies would absolutely have the ability to come and explain why a particular regulation was so important. We would work with every single agency to make sure that that happened. So, you know, it's easy to live in this dystopian world that we're all trying to kill everybody and cut off their fingers and toes and legs. But that just isn't the case. The reality is, is the RAINS Act does nothing more than for a small subset of the rules we're attempting to take back the authority that Congress has under the Constitution. So the experts would still exist. I mean, they've got to administer these laws, so there would still be experts there. And they would still be writing rules, but they would be sending them to us to adjudicate with the best interests of our constituents at mind. And if our constituents decide we did a bad job of adjudicating their <laughs> best interests, they can get rid of us. That's but right. they can't do that with these administrative agents. So, um, and also, I mean, what does it say to say that we don't have the expertise we need here in Congress 
to pass some of these laws. That's an indictment. <laughs> Maybe we should have some more expertise uh, here present among our staff and among the committee staffs. I don't know if you look at the proportion of funding that's gone to the executive branch versus the legislative branch, beginning at, with our country's founding to now, the, ex, the executive branch has grown exponentially, and there they, they do possess experts. Maybe we should bring some more of that expertise here. But in the meantime, it's not up for them to write the laws. They can suggest them, and then we can decide whether we want to take the advice of the experts, and then our constituents decide if we've done a good job of adjudicating whether those rules are proper. Um, there was another specific objection to the RAINS Act in the committee. I haven't heard it here today except for a brief mention, and that is that it's uh, not constitutional, that there was a Supreme Court case, INS versus Chadha, that said that you can't do this sort of thing. You can't have a legislative veto. Uh, Representative Hageman, do you want to uh, address that and, and explain why this is uh, constitutional and why it doesn't have the problems that the uh, Supreme Court objected to in the prior legislation? Well, that, that decision, the, when, when that was raised during the hearing, we all looked at that case pretty quickly. It was very clear that it has absolutely nothing to do with the RAINS Act and that the RAINS Act would never be considered to come within the admonition issued by the Supreme Court in the Chadha decision. I will go back to the Constitution and, and my Federalist papers here. And, uh, you know, I agree with you. I think that we ought to study. I've spent a lot of time today preparing for this hearing because I thought that you would want me to know what I was talking about when I sat in front of you. I don't think that that's unreasonable to ask of all of our members of Congress. We ought to know what we're talking about, and we ought to know about what laws we're passing. That is, that, that's just a minimum uh, standard, I would think. But it's not unconstitutional because the Constitution says it's not unconstitutional. We're the ones that get to pass the laws. The only authority that the agencies have comes through us. And if they are either not authorized or they are exceeding their authority, we are the ones that get to rein them in. Um, so it, it can't be unconstitutional when the Constitution says we're the ones that are supposed to be doing it. And Chada does not say anything different than that. That referred to a legislative veto. This isn't about a legislative veto. This is proactive legislation going forward that to the extent that the EPA or USDA or Department of Transportation or Commerce or any other agency adopts a rule that has an economic impact of $100 million, then we get to say yay or nay. That's not a legislative veto. That's doing our jobs. Absolutely. Uh, I think they were way off the mark when they tried to equate the RAINS Act to, the, to a legislative veto because, in fact, what happens in the process here, just to remind folks who aren't as familiar as you are with this bill, the, the suggestion for the rule comes to Congress, and then we do our job as outlined in the Constitution, following exactly those principles. It's passed in the House, it's passed in the Senate, then it goes to the President, to present it to the President, who can then veto it or sign it. And that is why it's uh, not related to the case that they referred to in our committee. Um, and I appreciate you, you speaking on that. I have, like I said, I've only heard a, a brief reference to it here today, but I wanted to clear that up for anybody who was concerned. Well, uh, I'm going to yield back, but first I just want to close by saying that I, I, I feel like we're in some kind of bizarre world where, you know, where half of Cong almost half of Congress is here arguing that we shouldn't have the power to make law, that the, other, that the executive branch is the only one qualified to make these decisions for our constituents. And I disagree, and the RAINS Act would put this back in order, back in constitutional order, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. With that, recognize my good friend from the great state of Texas. I thank the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, and I would just tell my friend from Pennsylvania that I was at Lukenbach, Texas, on, on Saturday for my wife's birthday, and I know the gentleman appreciates Texas country music. And I wish the chairman were here, so he was talking about OU softball. I could regale University of Texas baseball being in the Super Regionals. Uh, we could have a little Longhorn Sooner battle, but uh, I'll, I'll try to do that when the chairman comes back. I wonder really quickly if my friend from Kentucky would tell the story quickly for the Rules Committee that he told in the Ju Judiciary Committee of the gentleman from Kentucky that was the genesis of the RAINS Act. 
Oh, I would love to speak about one of my favorite constituents, Lloyd Rogers, who wrote the Reigns Act. He had this. He was a he was a Korean War veteran. Uh, he came back. He ran for county judge executive, and he was troubled at, at the degree to which the administrative state was running things, particularly our federal government. So he wrote this bill and he gave it to the congressman before me in this district. And the congressman said, that's a pretty good idea. Let me take it to our lawyers and ledge counsel uh, reworked it. He introduced this bill and it's one of the most popular bills in Congress. It's the one I get the most phone calls for. And um, Lloyd Rogers is still with us. He's watching every one of these hearings. He's very inspired. This is another part of the way the process is supposed to work according to the constitution. People come up with an idea and they bring it to their congressman. They don't come up with a regulation and take it to the <laughs> regulators. And so Lloyd Rogers epitomizes service to our country and the way this process is supposed to work. And uh, I look forward to passing this and then going back home and shaking Lloyd Rogers' hand. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roy. Well, I thank my friend from Kentucky. And um, I would just make a couple of observations. Earlier, uh, one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I don't recall who, said that there's not enough time in the day, might have been General Lady from Pennsylvania, I'm not sure, uh, that not enough time in the day uh, for Congress to weigh in effectively on each and every regulation. And I would just ask the General Lady from Wyoming if she sees in that statement an ad, you know, acknowledgement of the problem, that we have in <laughs> fact a bureaucratic state <coughs> that is engaged in so many regulations that the people's repre representatives are unable to actually, in the words of my colleague on the other side of the aisle, though I disagree with the assertion that we're unable to deal with it, uh, she would suggest that there was not enough time in the day to weigh in on all the regulations. Isn't that an admission that there's so many regulations going on by the bureaucratic, unelected administrative state, that that's a problem, and that reclaiming that power back into the People's House and the Article I Congress is actually paramount? I would absolutely agree with it, and I would add to it that there is a cost to these regulations. And in 2021, that regula regulatory cost was $2 trillion. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that there are way too many regulations with well over 3,000 being adopted every year, it's a $2 trillion hidden tax that every single one of us pay. It's about $14,900 per household in additional expense associated with the regulatory burden in this country that is, again, a hidden tax that is caused by unelected bureaucrats that nobody said, please, as Mr. Massey has said, please go adopt another regulation limiting my ability to choose which car I want to drive. Well, another statistic that was raised with this, that this would apply to something in the zip code of, of 100 regulations a year, assuming that that is the number of regulations that would qualify under the $100 million economic impact. Um, I don't know if that's an exact stat, but that's still a fairly astounding, significantly uh, large number of regulations that would apply uh, 100 regulations a year. And I just would wonder uh, if the general lady would have comment on that point and about the bureaucratic state and how that, that speaks to it. And then secondly, how you would, the general lady had referenced uh, the extent to which our states and localities engage in an enormous amount of their own regulatory power and the police powers that are granted to them under the Constitution, or I guess recognized in them under the Constitution, uh, whether it's Wyoming or Texas, our own TCEQ, right, our uh, Council on Econo Environmental Quality, um, and our own you know, Clean Air, Clean Water Acts, which predated the federal. Um, I wonder if the general lady could speak to that as well. Well, that's exactly right. That's what so many people fail to understand is that the states also have a, a, an array of regulations and statutes in place as well. So what has happened is that the federal government has attempted to expand its power, and most specifically the executive branch through the regulatory regime that we're talking about here. So what has happened with the EPA, for example, I would argue that the EPA has become increasingly prosecutorial rather than regulatory in some of the things that they have done. So they've gone out and, for example, determined that someone who moved an irrigation ditch should have had a 404 permit. Uh, and for that reason, under the Clean Water Act, bring an enforcement action against him. And the guy's facing penalties of $65 million for affecting 2.1 acres of land on his own property. Those are the kinds of things that these agencies do. The, the gentleman from, Miss, from Kentucky was alluding to that. 
that there are criminal penalties associated with these regulations, and yet there's absolutely no legislative oversight. So you have not only the federal regulations, you have the state regulations as you're talking about, and typically it's the states that are carrying out most of these regulations, because again, you've got your people here in Washington, D.C., but they're not out in the field doing it, whether it's the Department of Transportation or whatever it may be. But again, I think that it's very important for people to understand that the states also have a regulatory regime that it is in addition to the federal regulatory regime. One other question that's been raised is the extent to which um, <clears throat> allegedly it's a problem that the CRA has only been used, you know, 20 odd times over a certain period of time. I don't remember the exact stat. And, but, but doesn't that miss the core point of, of the RAINS Act? And that the CRA is basically a construct that allows an undo, right? It allows Congress to step in and say, whoa, 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 what are you doing with this regulation? We'd like to insert ourselves, but you can only do that within, I can't remember the exact number, what, 90 legislative days? days yeah. So you have 90 legislative days. So in truth, the CRA is really only applicable when you have a transfer of power in the White House with usually a House that has a, or a Congress that has a different party in control, right? So the CRA has a very, very limited function, a little, very limited ability to actually serve as a check on the regulatory state. Isn't that the real reason why it's been used so few times? Well, it's been used so few times, but it's been successful so few times. And again, the example being that it is that the House, the current House is controlled by Republicans. The Senate is controlled by Democrats. Yet even during the 118th Congress, I identified three different circumstances where there was bicameral support to overturn three different regulations issued by this administration, and the, and the president vetoed every one of them. So the CRA cannot work when you've got a president who's passing the regulations, even when his own party may be opposed to the regulations that he's attempting to pass. So we've got WOTUS, the tariff repeal on solar panels, and the ESG requirements. Both the House, Republican House, Democrat Senate, we've used the CRA. Right. And we said, we don't like this regulation. That's the way Article One, Section 1 is supposed to work. Yet even under that circumstance, the president, because these regulations are so often political, not for the purpose for which they are put forth, they are political statements, you can't even get a CRA and, through. And notable, right, that the CRA was in fact uh, used and then signed by the president with respect to a, a, a issue involving the District of Columbia, because not as directly political, but the but the because you know yeah, I can punt that to DC. But here, the president's standing in the in the way in the will of Congress, which I think undermines, by the way, the whole presentment question, right? The whole yes. Chada issue, because the fact is, with the Reigns Act, it actually reverses that. It empowers Congress. It empowers Congress significantly more, because instead of having to step in and undo a regulation and only undo that regulation in the beginning of the next Congress where you've got maybe 90 legislative days to do it. You have the Reigns Act where you're able to go say, well, wait a second, wait a second. If there's a regulation that's problematic and Congress thinks there's an issue with it, then Congress can act because Congress will have to say yes or no to said regulation and then present it to the president of the United States. So in fact, you have the opposite of a presentment problem. You have a legitimate uh, exercise of power by Congress saying, wait a second, that regulatory state, when you have that kind of an impact, Congress should have a voice. Is that not all correct? To Absolutely. Wyoming? Absolutely, that's correct. And what's interesting about it is that when, the, it, when I referenced the roadless rule earlier, Congress was very concerned about what the roadless rule would do in terms of our ability to control forest fires and address pine beetle outbreak and those kinds of things. But the only option that they really had was to go to the GAO and ask the GAO to force the Forest Service to start issuing reports about what the environmental impact of that rule would be. So you've got a circumstance where Republican and Democrats both are looking at this massive regulation, which at the time was the largest rulemaking in US history. They're looking at this massive regulation and they're all saying, we don't think that this is a good idea. And they almost had no mechanism at all other than to study it for them to actually block it. And they ultimately couldn't do that, but they did issue the reports talking about the environmental degradation that the, that the rule would have. Ooh. I. Oh, go ahead. And I recently questioned the head of the Forest Service and got him to admit that the roadless rule did exactly what we said it was going to do, which has been environmentally devastating to the interior West. When I went to the gentlelady, we'll uh, 
just bear with me for a minute and see if she agrees. We're talking about the importance of these things. Um, for example, WOTUS. In January of 2023, EPA and Army Corps issued new WOTUS rules that trample property rights and subject farmers, ranchers, and businesses to the whims of bureaucrats. And as a reminder, in 2016, the EPA imprisoned 77-year-old Navy veteran Joe Robertson for 18 months for building ponds on his remote Montana property to fight forest fires. The general lady familiar with that with a state that's really proximate to your home state. Yes. Um, coal. In March of 2023, the EPA finalized a, quote, good neighbor plan to regulate power plant ozone that would eliminate half of Texas' coal-fired generation fleet in just a few years. Meanwhile, this summer in Texas, we will see more demand for electricity than can be met with our dispatchable generation capacity alone. Yet this is done by administrative fiat, not by anybody elected, not by anybody checking that. It's being done by administrative bureaucrats. Um, EPA proposed rules that would force two-thirds of the new vehicles <coughs> in the United States to be electric by 2032. Now, first of all, the plumber hanging out in San Marcos, Texas, or <coughs> somewhere in a small town anywhere in America or in Wyoming, do you think that the individual working right now is saying, oh boy, man, please have an electric vehicle that's going to cost two or three, four times as much, or I'm going to have to plug in and use as much electricity as an air conditioning unit in powering up my house, the same amount of electricity to charge up that battery-powered vehicle, and then wonder if I can get from one side of Wyoming to the other, or wonder whether I can get from my place in Austin out to, say, Midland through the state of West Texas. But somewhere in some study group or focus group in the bowels of Harvard, this seems like a great idea. But we've got a bunch of bureaucrats from the bowels of Harvard or wherever they're from sitting over in administrative agencies deciding what that plumber in Texas or what that individual in Wyoming gets to do. How about the fact that the grid, the EPA proposed a rule to force power plants to cut their emissions by an unachievable 90% between 2035 and 2040 or otherwise shut down. The EIA estimates that the Inflation Reduction Act, so-called, could make wind and solar account for nearly 60% of U.S. Electric electricity generation by 2050. Wind and solar make up just 12% of U.S. generation. Those are related because despite that being legislation that was passed last August, you have the EPA proposing rules that, when joined with it, cripple. I just want to be very clear to every American out there. Cripples your ability to have a reliable grid or one that you can afford. How about loans? Biden's half-trillion-dollar student loan bailout is forcing a veteran to subsidize his neighbor's master's degree despite actually sacrificing for the United States. Right now, we got almost a half a trillion dollar by executive fiat, which the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, acknowledged the president did not have the power to do. And yet here we sit saying, shouldn't Congress have the, uh, not just the power, but the duty to check a regulation like that sent to us from the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, or better stated, from the alphabet soup of agencies between here and there? How about the ATF's pistol brace rule that just went into effect last week? Millions of Americans. Millions of Americans sitting out there today are felons for buying a constitutionally protected product and having a plastic attachment attached to it. That's the truth. They are punishable up to 10 years in prison and thousands of dollars of fines because they have a product that was legal when they bought it attached to a constitutionally protected weapon, and they are now going to be subject to possibly being a felon. How? Did Congress vote on that? The gentlelady, did the Congress vote on any of these things I'm no. talking about? No. Or were these all done by administrative executive fiat? Exactly. All done by administrative agencies. How about vaccines? The CMS vaccine mandate rule continue to, continues to force 10.4 million healthcare workers in this country to take a needle in their arm or lose their job. Remember OSHA? Remember the administration tried to implement an OSHA rule to force $4 million, uh, I'm sorry, 4 million, 84 million Americans to take a vaccine? Thankfully, the court struck it down. But where was Congress? Nowhere, because the executive branch right. could use administrative executive fiat to make decisions. This is precisely why we have separation of powers. It's precisely why we're supposed to execute on the separation of powers. And it is precisely why the RAIN Act is so critically important. I assume the gentlelady would agree. Yes, I do. So one or two other quick questions. I would just say maybe to the, to, to the gentleman, uh, Mr. Johnson, the gentleman from Georgia, um, am I correct that in the recent uh, debt ceiling bill that was passed last week, passed by the Senate, uh, I guess late last week, um, 
that in that bill there was some sort of administrative PAYGO regulatory uh, language that was uh, inserted into the debt ceiling bill. No, it was not. Was not? Uh, the, I think there, there was supposed to be, there was administrative PAYGO language, that is that requiring the administration to go through the process of saying if a regulation had a certain impact, right, that they would have to then go figure out how to pay for that impact on the fly, like administrative PAYGO. But my point of bringing that question up, which that is in the debt ceiling bill, is it is also waivable, right? I believe that in the debt ceiling bill, that language which was inserted into the bill is fully waivable by the OMB director. Is that, does the gentleman from Georgia believe well, that to be true? I, I think you may know a little bit more about it. You, you voted against it. Uh, so well, I would hope we probably, all, I, hope, I would hope those who voted for it know a lot about it more than those who voted against it, yeah. to be honest with you. Well, you're in a position to educate us, but that is not our topic here today. Oh, well, I, I, I would, I would uh, take issue with that so, and allow the gentleman well, to expand on it. It is precisely the topic because we passed the RAINS Act as part of the debt ceiling package, Limit, Save, Grow, in late April. And in that RAINS Act, we would have been able to constrain the Biden administration. However, last week, the debt ceiling, quote, deal, unquote, was cut. And Democrats at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue demanded that we take out the RAINS Act and insert instead administrative pay-go, which is, to the best of my understanding, fully waivable. And in fact, fully waivable, such that the OMB director, Shalanda Young, said she would waive it if, quote, deemed necessary to make sure President Biden's agenda is carried forward, end quote. I think my question was going to just simply be, why would it need to be waived? That would be my question, but I, I'm not sure that the gentleman's expert on this subject. And no, so yeah. I'd, I'd just say to the gentlelady from Wyoming, why would you think it would need to be waived? Well, I wouldn't think it would ever need to be waived. Right. But they're going to waive it because they're going to continue with an agenda that is crushing the economy and crushing our middle class and, uh, and violating our Constitution. Which is precisely the reason why... We included the RAINS Act in the debt ceiling bill to start with because we knew full well the administration would, of course, waive any kind of provision that is waivable. By her own admission, she said that she would waive it. Um, thus is the state of things in the swamp. The swamp often wins when presented with a choice. The swamp is going to choose the thing that's going to continue to perpetuate the swamp. So therein lies the problem with that uh, particular question. The second question is the student loan payoffs. I think it is correct, and I'd ask the gentleman from Georgia, that the student loan bailout provision, the provisions that are almost $500 billion, that those provisions uh, that were removed from uh, being in place under the debt ceiling bill that this House passed out in late April, that was removed at the demand of the White House and the acquiescence of the House. Uh, that was removed from the debt ceiling bill last week. Does the gentleman agree? that the bailout for student loans is no longer in, in the debt ceiling bill? I'm not going to get into a discussion about the debt ceiling. That was a victory uh, for the American people. It's something that has been passed, signed into law. I voted for it. You voted against it. I you've, got a, you've got an uh, ax to grind about it, and I can appreciate the fact that you would use this opportunity to do so. But I'm not in the position to engage you on that issue in this hearing. So the reason that I raise the question is not to uh, dwell or refocus on the absurdity of the debt deal that was cut last week. Uh, it is rather to raise the point that you have an executive branch that made an executive decision, an administrative action, Unlawfully, by the well, way, an executive that, that, order that is was, different from an administrative. You had you had action rule by the executive branch. You had action by the executive branch. Yeah. That, that's carried not out, the same as a uh, carried as a, out as a uh, regulation issued by a federal agency, and that's what we're talking about you, today. You have the executive branch carrying out by fiat from the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue through its agencies, enforced through its agencies and through the rulemaking authority, you have them going through the process of canceling, getting rid of, forgiving, 
providing a bailout, whatever words we want to use, for almost half a trillion dollars worth of student loans. Congress has and authorized the administration to do that. So herein lies the great question. Herein lies the whole point. Who decides? And in this case, what we're saying is, is that bureaucrats and the executive branch decide without Congress speaking to the actual spending of half a trillion dollars. And when we did speak to it, we pull it out, it's not there, and here we sit. And all we're trying to say is, in this bill, in the RAINS Act, which should have been passed last week in the debt ceiling bill, along with the student loan cancellation repeal, but neither were. And so now what we're saying is, can we at least protect against future abuse by the executive branch to say, hey, let's pass this bill, a bill which we all firmly uh, expect not to pass the Senate, by the way, so it therefore becomes a messaging bill rather than using the debt ceiling to actually get it done, side note. But cannot we just pass this piece of legislation to say to the executive branch, hey, maybe you should have to come to Congress before you act, before you go blow half a trillion dollars in direct unfairness to the 87% of Americans who do not have student loans or those who never took out student loans. Does the gentleman from Wyoming agree with that point? Well, I agree, a absolutely. There, there is no circumstance under our Constitution where an executive branch by executive order or regulation should be able to adopt something that would have an impact of, of half a trillion dollars without coming to Congress. It's absolutely unconstitutional. There's a litany of other issues that I could put into the record and I won't, but there's uh, amendments that we'll be having that we're offering that deal with a whole lot of issues that don't necessarily get uh, uh, absorbed into the $100 million economic impact, or at least obviously, that I think are important to, uh, to make sure we address, and we'll address those on the floor. Uh, but just to, to close, um, under no circumstances should the People's House be turning over the ability to uh, make decisions on these important matters to unelected bureaucrats uh, that have no check in our separation of powers in our system of government. With that, I would yield back my time. Thank you. Gentle lady from Indiana is recognized for any questions she might have for our panel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming to testify before us today. We appreciate your time. Uh, I'm so glad we're considering H.R. 277, um, the regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act of 2023, or the RAINS Act. I'm a proud co-sponsor, an original co-sponsor of this bill. If the Biden administration has taught us anything, it's that this administration and the bureaucrats within it are in desperate need of scrutiny, to say the least. And it's our job, with the help of this bill, to rein in regulations and to hold this administration accountable. Congresswoman Hageman, it's always good to see a fellow female freshman legislator up here, and welcome to your first Rules Committee. Thank you. Um, I want to just uh, summarize the three biggest aspects of the RAINS Act, and um, as I see them for constituents back home, and I hope you won't mind, I'm just going to ask you a couple of, of questions uh, about that would cover conceptually what the RAINS Act is doing. Is it accurate that the RAINS Act would require Congress's support before any, quote, major rule goes into effect? Yes. Is it accurate that the RAINS Act would help to restore Congress's Article I responsibilities by putting Congress back in the driver's seat on major decisions affecting the American people? Yes. Is it accurate that the RAINS Act protects the will of the American voter by ensuring that Congress is the body making major decisions, not unelected bureaucrats in Washington? Yes. Thank you. I couldn't think of uh, more common sense legislation that we should be considering. The people's representatives are entrusted with making the hard decisions, and the RAINS Act rightly puts us, puts the burden back on us to deliver those results. And in this bill, House Republicans are delivering for our constituents by holding the Biden administration accountable. Uh, Ms. Hageman, one of the things I hear most from constituents back home in Indiana is pleading to literally rein in the size and scope of the federal government and the out-of-control regulatory state. Am I right in assuming your constituents in the great state of Wyoming feel the same as mine, mine do? Absolutely. Uh, before, Thank you. Before I close, I, I just wanted to, um, we've gone over sort of conceptually what the RAINS Act is doing, but I, I, I want to talk about what it actually says. So it establishes an approval process for a major rule. A major rule may only take effect if Congress approves. A major rule is defined as a rule that has resulted in or is likely to result in one, an annual effect on the economy of $100 million or more, 
to a major increase in costs or prices for consumers or individuals, government agencies or geographic regions, and three, significant adverse effects on competition, investment, productivity, innovation, or the ability of US-based enterprises to compete with foreign entities. So I wanna take a look at some of the Biden rules and proposed rules um, that, that may or may not fall under um, the RAINS Act um, because the, those that I looked at did not have a score on how much the, they would cost. The Thrifty Food Plan, even though it was implemented following the COVID-19 pandemic, the Thrifty Food Plan increases SNAP benefits by $36.24 per person per month, an increase of more than 25% from pre-pandemic levels and the largest permanent increase in benefits in the program's history. The proposed rule minimizing the risks of climate change in federal acquisitions requires federal agencies to give preference to bidders whose proposals have a lower carbon impact. That has no regard to the cost of doing business, what might save taxpayer dollars, it requires preference to the lower carbon uh, footprint. A rescission of a Trump era rule which enabled the expedited removal of certain new classes of undocumented immigrants. Overturning the Trump Health and Human Services Sunset Clause. The result means that HHS is now no longer forced to reduce its regulatory capacity. A proposed restricting the definition of an independent contractors <laughs> making it more difficult for companies to hire workers as independent contractors and instead requiring them to be designated as employees. Requiring federal contractors to disclose, and I love this one, especially with, uh, with our friends on the other side of the aisle uh, disliking the RAINS Act in particular. Requiring federal contractors to disclose their greenhouse gases and climate-related financial risk for contractors that receive greater than 50 million in funding from the federal government. So we can't ask the agencies to um, allow us to approve when they're spending more than $100 million on a rule, uh, but we can require federal contractors to disclose uh, greenhouse gas emissions if they're receiving more than $50 million in funding. I could go on. Efficiency standards for washing machines and refrigerators, proposed revisions to the Clean Power Plan referred to as new source performance standards, which will undoubtedly have a significant impact on utility costs and grid reliability. So we heard from our colleagues on the other side of the aisle that regulations should be left to the, quote, experts. But let's be certain as to what our Democrat friends are saying. They want unelected bureaucrats to have unimpeded authority to not only make rules that act as laws, but also spend significant amounts of taxpayer money. We heard our friends on the other side of the aisle say the RAINS Act would apply to around 100 regulations a year. And you said this, Ms. Hageman, about the cost of that. Let's put that in perspective. If 100 proposed regulations will cost $100 million or more, that's a regulatory cost of trillions of dollars. They would support the government and our economy taking a trillion dollar plus impact without any input from the people through their elected representatives. Uh, finally, I'd, I'd like us to consider, uh, encourage us to consider including the cost of rule rescissions. Uh, we had many Trump era rules that were rescinded and the cost of those are substantial or executive orders in the RAINS Act. When we passed the Fiscal Responsibility Act last week, we promised to come back every day fighting for fiscal sanity and out of control spending. So I'm pleased to be here considering today and supporting the RAINS Act toward the goal of restoring the fiscal sanity in Washington. It's clear the regulatory regime of unelected bureaucrats has gotten completely out of control from what our founders intended. And I hope colleagues on both sides of the aisle will join me in supporting this important legislation. Thank you to the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady, and I thank both of you for appearing before us today. Uh, witnesses are now excused. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. And once they've had a chance to uh, uh, leave the table, I'd uh, like to welcome our second panel, Representative Jeff Duncan and Ranking Member Frank Ballone from the Committee on Energy and Commerce. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. while we're waiting for them to, to uh, take their seats, you, you, you were not present when I was able to at least regale our fellow committee folks about the University of Texas making it to the Super Regionals in baseball in light of your announcement about the University of Oklahoma. I won't bring up Clemson out of respect for my friend <laughs> who's now taking the mic. Well, they play pretty good baseball in Texas, so it's no big surprise to me. Anyway, well, uh, again, I want to welcome our, our two witnesses in the second panel. And Mr. Duncan, uh, we welcome 
to the Rules Committee, and I welcome your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Ranking Member McGovern for recognizing me to speak. In support of H.R. 1640, the Save Our Gas Stoves Act, and H.R. 1615, the Gas Stove Protection and Freedom Act. It's really hard to believe that we're here talking about the federal government banning an appliance such as a gas stove. H.R. 1640, the Save Our Gas Stoves Act, is a bipartisan bill that was introduced by Energy and Commerce member Debbie Lesko to stop the Department of Energy from finalizing its proposed regulations to ban the majority of natural gas-fueled cooking stoves on the market today. H.R. 1615, the Gas Stove Protection and Freedom Act, is a bipartisan bill introduced by Energy and Commerce member Kelly Armstrong to prevent the Consumer Protect Product Safety Commission from undertaking work that could result in an outright ban or a substantial price increase in the cost of a new gas stove for Americans, while allowing the CPSC to continue the important safety work of the Commission. These bills are necessary because the Democrats coordinated all-out war on oil and gas and our government getting into household kitchens. In January, Consumer Product Safety Commissioner Trumpka suggested that CPSC should consider a ban on gas stoves. Commissioner Trumpka's uh, threat to ban gas stoves received a lot of attention, and while the chair of the CPSC and the White House tried to walk it back, the real agenda of the extremist embedded in the administration was on full display. Furthermore, neither the president nor the chair of CPSC have rebuked advocacy groups like the Rocky Mountain Institute, which I'll note has a questionable tie to China and that alone should raise concerns on both sides of the aisle. I'll start with H.R. 1640. In February, the Department of Energy proposed new regulations that would effectively ban more than half of the gas cooking stoves on the market today. Americans do not want the federal government to tell them how to live, live their lives, whether it's the kind of car they drive or how they cook their food. Regrettably, the Department of Energy plans to do just that. DOE is caving to radical environmental activists agreeing to a backroom sue and settle deals to regulate thousands of consumer products and appliances over the next two years. DOE's proposal to ban gas stoves is just the tip of the iceberg. Members should also be aware that DOE has plans to regulate virtually every appliance in our homes, including air conditioners, refrigerators, washing machines, hot water heaters, dryers, and even microwave ovens. The Department of Energy's proposal to ban gas stoves is deeply unpopular and I believe it also violates the statutory requirements of the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. The law requires the DOE to prove that proposed efficiency standards are cost-effective and save a significant amount of energy. The law also prohibits DOE from using efficiency standards as a backdoor ban on natural gas. How do we know this new rule is politically motivated? Well, that's because DOE evaluated the existing efficiency standards for stoves and ovens in 2020 and declined, declined proceed with new regulations explaining that any new standards would not be economically justified and would not result in a significant amount of energy savings. It's clear that DOE's most recent proposal fails the statutory test to issue new regulations. When DOE evaluated the proposed standards, it found that 96% of the gas stove models it tested would not comply. DOE also found that uh, average annual consumer savings under the proposed rule would only be $1.08 over the average lifetime of the product. Let me repeat that. DOE, DOE found that the average annual consumer savings under the proposed rule would only be $1.08 over the average lifetime of the product. The Energy and Commerce Committee has examined DOE's efficiency standards, setting process through roundtables and background hearings. H.R. 1640 has been through a regular order in the committee where DOE Secretary Granholm testified on the legislation and committee members marked up the bill and favorably reported it with a strong bipartisan vote. Next, I want to turn to H.R. 1615, which addresses the CPSC regulations for gas stoves. The minority during the markup and in their minority views have attempted to mislead the American people about what this bill actually does. Committee Democrats have falsely claimed that H.R. 1615 would stop the CPSC from using federal funds to issue and enforce safety standards for gas stoves. This is simply not true. H.R. 1615 would not prohibit the CPSC from acting under its statute to address true safety hazards associated with faulty gas stoves. Nothing in H.R. 16 would prevent the CPSC from conducting product recall, putting out a safety notice, participating in voluntary standards develop, development uh, related to gas stoves, or conduct rulemaking, so long as the result is not a broad ban, prohibition on sale, or a substantial price increase to the average price of a gas stove in the United States. 
HR 1640 and HR 1615 are both important bipartisan bills, and I strongly encourage my colleagues to join me in the support. And with that, I'd like to thank the Rules Committee for meeting on this legislation today, and I look forward to sending it over to the Senate and ultimately to the President's desk. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Ranking Member Pallone, you're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Cole and members of the committee. I'm here today to voice my strong opposition to these two bills that are based on what I consider the false notion that the Biden administration is planning on banning gas stoves. And let me be emphatically clear, the Biden administration is not planning to ban gas stoves, but that has not stopped Republican, Republicans saying, uh, from saying so. Now, the first bill is H.R. 1615, the Gas Stoves Protection and Freedom Act. The Consumer Product Safety Commission has a long history of protecting American children and families from hazardous products. But H.R. 1615 was set a dangerous precedent by stifling the CPSC's ability to investigate potentially hazardous products. It would then limit the tools the CPSC has for dealing with any hazards it identifies. As an example of how harmful this could be, last December, the agency issued a recall of a gas stove product that was found to be a serious risk of injury or death from carbon monoxide poisoning. The CPSC was doing its job and recalling a dangerous product. This Republican legislation would prohibit the agency from using its rulemaking authority to ban such hazardous products, which could endanger the lives of any American who has that dangerous product in their home. The bill essentially prevents the CPSC from doing its job. We should be empowering the agency to protect consumers from hazardous products, not protecting potentially hazardous products. And our constituents should be able to have confidence that their household products are safe and do not cause undue harm to them or their children. To that end, we should make sure that the CPSC has all the tools it needs to identify and mitigate the risks of injury and death created by unsafe products. And this legislation, in my opinion, ties the CPSC's hands, which could harm consumers, and that's why I oppose it. Now, the second bill, H.R. 1640, is designed to prevent the Department of Energy from finalizing a recently proposed energy efficiency standard for electric and gas stoves and cooktops. The proposed DOE rule will save the American families money, reduce emissions, and reduce harmful indoor air pollutants. It's a smart and common sense policy. 50% of the products on the market already meet the proposed standard, and they're readily available design changes for those that don't. And keep in mind, we're talking three years from when, if you have the stove now, you could keep it. But it's three years after this rule is finalized before these new design uh, and efficiency standards will go into place by the manufacturers. So I don't know why it's so controversial. Common sense energy efficiency standards save Americans money and reduce emissions. These standards are popular, and cooktops that meet the standard are already on the market. Republicans claim to care about energy prices, but this bill prohibits DOE from finalizing a rule that could save consumers up to $1.7 billion dollars. So again, I strongly oppose the second bill. It stands in the way of DOE doing its job, and it tries to influence and hold back future DOE rulemaking that could help lower energy costs for American families. So Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee, I oppose these bills. Look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank the gentleman for his testimony. The chair has no questions at this time, so we'll move the gentleman from Pennsylvania for any questions you might have for our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. You know, with this topic, there's a lot of confusion over who said what. So I think it's important just to go over the timeline and exact quotes. Uh, in January 2023, the Consumer Product Safety Commissioner, Trumka, stated the commission would look at regulations to ban gas stoves in American homes. That's January 2023. After, a ma after major public outrage at that announcement, the media then went on this gaslighting campaign with articles from the USA Today, the New York Times, Washington Post, in the LA Times saying that there was no validity to claiming the administration wanted to ban gas stoves. Again, in January 2023, 20, uh, this January, Trump st state stated that he wanted to look at banning gas stoves. Then President Biden's press secretary said, and I quote, the president does not support banning gas stoves. Okay. Uh, January 23rd, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, when asked about banning gas stoves, stated, and I quote, that is so ridiculous, that story, because it sounds like the government's coming in to take your stuff. That is so not true, end quote. 
Then in February, just seven days later, February 1st, the Department of Energy proposed a new rule that would effectively ban half of the gas stoves currently on the market. Last month, New York became the first state to ban gas-powered stoves, furnaces, and propane heating in new residential construction starting in 2026. And then more than 100 U.S. cities and localities have moved in the meantime to restrict gas-powered appliances, including 75 cities in California alone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter in the record a series of articles chronicling the banning of um, gas stoves. First is a CNN article. New York becomes the first state to ban natural gas stoves and furnaces in most new buildings. That's from May 3rd, 2023. Without objection. It has unanimous consent to enter in the record another article from the Washington Times entitled, Energy Secretary Defends Biden Administration's Gas Stove Regulation Vows Nobody Will Take Your Gas Stoves, uh, May 11, 2023. Without objection. Um, I'd also like to point out that in that article, it says the Energy Department is proposing new efficiency rules for gas stoves. About half current models of the market would likely be unable to comply with. Uh, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter another Washington Examiner article. This is gas stove bans. Here's where the initiatives stand across the U.S. Uh, that's from May 3rd, 2023. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter another article. This was from Forbes. It's entitled, Biden officials just can't take their hands off your gas stoves. That's from February 3rd, 2023. Without objection. So with that being said, uh, Representative Duncan, given all the facts mentioned, all the gaslighting we've seen from the Democratic Party and from the media on this, would you like to talk about where the regulation stands and where the push to ban gas stoves stands? Well, the department's been clear. They have proposed a regulation, and uh, the ranking member just said upon enactment of this new regulation and went through a whole litany of timelines and when uh, those appliances would not be available. So it, it either is or it isn't an, an attempt by the administration to ultimately ban gas stoves. One, one thing that needs to be noted is this is not just household appliances. About 60% of restaurants across the nation prepare the meals that we enjoy in the restaurants on gas fired stoves. They, re they do it because it's efficient. No business is going to run a natural gas fired stove if it's more costly than having an electric stove. They do it for the efficiency of cooking and for the cost savings that it provides our bottom line and the restaurants. Americans want to have choices in their consumer appliances, what they use in their homes. And this bill just says, don't put the government between my gas stove and me. Thank you. I just want to point out that uh, the de facto ban on gas stoving, uh, gas cooking appliances would cause Americans to spend an extra 23 hours a year waiting for water to boil. Not to mention that natural gas is three times less expensive than other energy sources. But uh, Representative uh, Duncan, the Biden administration and my friends across the aisle have touted a half-baked study claiming that 13% of all child asthma cases are caused by gas stoves. Do you know of any reputable studies that have shown this link? I do not. Would you like to talk about the half-baked study they're citing? Well, I haven't seen the studies. I don't really want to talk about something I haven't, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not privy to. But I will say that the talk about efficiency and, and, um, and cost savings for Americans, let me just point out what I said earlier, that the proposed standard would only save Americans a dollar and eight cent over the life of the appliance. Now that dollar eight comes from averaging the dollar fifty one average annual savings for gas and the point seven nine annual savings for electric, weighted by the market segments identified by the DOE's own analysis, electric versus gas. So the savings aren't there. And if you look at why the Department of Energy even is, was empowered to propose these type of regulations, it was about efficiency and it was about savings for Americans. And it clearly shows there are no efficiency. Uh, deficiencies, and there's no major cost savings for Americans with this regulation. We'll go back to cost savings in just a second, but going back to that study, it's my understanding that, and excuse me for um, asking about it, I didn't know that, um, uh, I didn't know you hadn't read it, but th there was no control, there, there was basically no control study on it, meaning that um, other studies have found that, that what's 
that the air quality degradation is actually from the cooking oil in a pan. It doesn't matter if that's on a gas stove or an electric stove. Um, further, the Federal Interagency Committee on Indoor Air Quality has never identified gas cooking stove as contributing to asthma or respiratory illness. Additionally, the Consumer Product Safety Commission and Environmental Protection Agency have never identified gas stoves as a significant contributor to adverse air quality or as a health hazard. So from my understanding, this is where the science is, despite the, um, the half-baked study my friends keep referring to. Uh, Representative Duncan, is it true that gas saves the average American family over $1,000 a year? Um, I, there's no doubt about that. Thank you. I appreciate it. You'll back. Thank you very much. General Lady from Pennsylvania is recognized for whatever questions she may have for the panel. Thank you so much. I, I love the fact that my colleagues are referring to gaslighting when we're talking about this whole insane, ridiculous gas stove conspiracy theory. It is so absurd. It really is off the charts, even for this House majority. Um, look, they seized upon an inartful statement by one government official and, shall we say, cooked up this crazy theory that someone's coming to get your gas stoves. We are talking about a regulation that is forward-looking, does not look at past stoves, looks at stoves to be sold in the future, where the government agency went out, it studied the stoves currently on the market, found that half of them already meet the standard, gave the rest of them three years to come up to snuff. That's pretty much how this stuff works. It's common sense. But instead, we have you know people defending their propane. It's crazy. I have a gas stove. I intend to use it. So does everybody else. It's like when you decide that there's a new airbag model that needs to be used because the old one's killing people. OK? You revise your regulations, and you move forward based upon the best available evidence. So this is just. I can't believe we're having to debate a bill entitled Gas Stoves and Freedom. This is bullshit. Sorry. Um, is there anything you would like to add, Mr. Plum? Well, I, I just, look, I, if I could just add to what you said. Um, if, if, I know that there's some on the other side of the aisle that think that everything that we do, uh, that agencies do, should be done by Congress and not by the agencies. I understand that, and I, of course, don't agree with that because I don't know how we could possibly spend all our time regulating every appliance and you know, determining what's hazardous and what's efficient. I mean, we have to rely on the agencies to do that. And essentially what these two bills say is, no, we're not doing that, right? In other words, we're not going to let the agency that decides whether there's hazards or safety problems do their job, uh, and we're going to never allow them to do it again, right? Uh, we're not going to allow the agency that tries to make things more efficient and save money and, you know, uh, and do things more efficiently do their job uh, because we don't believe that they know what they're talking about. Um, you know, the, the previous conversation here was about how everything that the DOE has done to make the appliances more efficient is false, right? I mean, I guess we could sit here and, and, and debate uh, whether, you know, forever, whether we think the information that they've gathered in order to say this is what, uh, how we can make these gas stoves more efficient, um, um, you know, is false. And we could spend hours on it. But my whole point is, how do we do that in Congress? We can't spend all our time questioning these agencies. That's what these agencies are for. And understand that the way these bills are written, it's not only that they would cancel these proposed rules, and it's only a proposed rule, right? But they would never allow them to deal with it again. And so they're basically saying, what's the point of having the agency? But the, prob the biggest problem is that even Mr. Duncan, who I admire, keeps saying that the administration is banning gas stoves. That's not what they're doing. It's simply not. And maybe somebody said that. I mean, I read the headline in the uh, New York, uh, what is it, the Daily Post? I mean, the Daily News or the New York Post one day about the mayor banning gas stoves. He may have. I don't know. Uh, but that's not what this administration is doing. So why do you keep saying we're banning gas stoves? That's not what we're doing. We're dealing with efficiency. We're dealing with hazards. And don't tell these agencies that they can't deal with that anymore, because otherwise, I, I don't know how we're going to substitute ourselves for that, which is essentially what I think the Republicans are saying. I think that's the wrong thing to do. So thank you. 
I, I know as a consumer, when I go to buy a new stove or refrigerator or the bench freezer for my cellar, I'm going to look at the energy efficiency ratings that these things have because I want to save money. I mean, that's the fiscally responsible thing to do as a consumer. Um, so I absolutely want our federal agencies weighing in on that. But beyond that, the basic premise behind um, this whole effort with this rule is uh, just wrong. Um, if we take the Department of Energy um, regulation that has come under fire, um, or that they're trying to torch, I don't know, however we want to put it. Um, that regulation was put together as a result of Congress authorizing the Department of Energy to regulate energy consumption of conventional cooking products, including gas stoves, under the Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975. And then in 1987, Congress enacted the National Appliance Energy Conservation Act, which established minimum efficiency standards. So Congress has already acted here and told the agency, this is what you need to do to administer the laws that Congress is enacting. So it's entirely something Congress has acted upon. It's working within whatever the current factors are. And isn't there an issue uh, with respect to one of the regulations that, that they're trying to address here, that there's a court order saying that these regulations have to occur now, that, that the energy or that the agency has to um, implement one of these regulations? I don't know specifically about the court, but yeah, I mean, the agency has the obligation to do this. There's no question. Okay, and that's as part of executing the will of Congress. Exactly. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The distinguished vice chair of the committees. I'll pass some questions. Thank okay. you, Mr. Uh, gentlelady from New Mexico. Thank you uh, so very much. Um, so I want to begin. Once again, I think so many of us around this table love our gas stoves, right? In New Mexico, you know, we love the gas stoves because we can make our tortillas on them and our delicious red chili and all of the things that both feed our souls and our panzas. But I agree with you, Representative Scanlon, that when I go to buy a new appliance, and these are, we're talking about new appliances, I really do appreciate the fact that they get more efficient and more efficient over time because it does save, our, save money and that uh, the proposed rule that we're talking about here actually says it might save one, from $650 million to $1.7 billion for the consumers. I know I am paying less in electricity uh, when I replaced uh, some of my appliances. Uh, so the concept is very good. But the other thing that when we take the time, the precious time um, to consider these bills, we are also not addressing some of the really important problems that affect America. Um, so Biden doesn't want to ban gas stoves. Congress isn't going to barge into homes in a hollow way your existing gas stoves. But what Congress could be doing is taking up Social Security forms consistent with the Social Security 2100 Act, which would guarantee the solvency of a program millions of Americans rely on and needs our support. 83% of Americans want us to protect and expand Social Security benefits. But we're not taking that up, even though it's very popular. Uh, why aren't we putting on the House floor the Dream and Promise Act to create an earned path to citizenship for dreamers, which 71% of Americans support. They want us to be doing this work. So instead of doing this really important work, we are taking up sort of something that got blown out of proportion. Uh, and I really wish we were spending our time on the issues that majorities, bat, you know, overwhelming majorities of Americans want us to do. Uh, and uh, I look forward to whenever I get around to buying my new gas stove, having to even be more efficient uh, because nobody's banning gas stoves. And, you know, my son is in culinary. He wants to continue using his gas stove. And so I'm going to make sure he gets to keep doing that. Thank you so very much. Well, let me ask uh, Representative Pallone, is there anything, I mean, a ranking member, is there anything else you want to add? We just have to keep emphasizing that no one is saying that if you have a stove that you have to get rid of it or throw it away. We're talking about, as you say, regulations for efficiency under DOE, which would be three years from when the, the rule is finalized. Right now it's just proposed. And the other one, which is you know, maybe even worse, is the fact that they would get rid of the, uh, the agency that determines what's hazardous 
and what's the safety problem for kids and, and others. The, they, the, the way these bills are written, they wouldn't have the authority to deal with either of these issues in the future, not only with what they don't like now, but even in the future. And that would be a terrible thing. I mean, gas stoves can be dangerous, and there are hazards if they're not uh, handled properly or manufactured properly. And I don't want to take that away from the agency. And I'm not going to substitute my analysis of what's safe or not. Well, and I think it's really interesting that when we learn more about things, I wasn't maybe as consistent with always turning on that exhaust fan and when it's nice opening my doors and once i learned about these things it's like oh i I myself i'm not replacing my gas stove now but i can take more action so knowledge is good uh and and science and research are good and we should not say we, we we cannot progress we should always be curious we should always be aiming to be better at everything we do so thank you very much thank you chairman uh and thank you ranking member Thank you. The gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I just wanted to um, point out a, a quote that I have found on um, Commissioner Trumka, who is the uh, commissioner of the U.S. Consumer Product and Safety Commission. And I'm going from a CBS News article from January, and he, he was nominated by President Biden and confirmed by the Senate. He's been serving since 2021. And from this CBS News article in January, it says, Trumpka told Blue Bloomberg News in an interview that, quote, a ban was on the table for gas stoves. Saying further that he said, uh, quote, we need to be talking about regulating gas stoves, whether it's drastically reducing emissions or banning gas stoves entirely. Banning is a powerful tool in our toolbox, and it is a real possibility here. So uh, whatever the opposition wants to say, and they want to say this is ridiculous and it's blown out of proportion and all kinds of things and flipped to other issues, this is serious. This, this is the commissioner that is leading this department, and he is talking about banning gas stoves. So for as much as the opposition wants to say it's ridiculous, it's a real issue. And people are concerned about it, and we are hearing from constituents about it. And so I support the bills um, in front of us to try to help this. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for any questions you may have for the panel. I'm trying to. I'll wait for Mr. Pallone. He seems distracted. I'm trying to figure out what the rule does that the Department of Energy is, is asking for or trying to promulgate. Mr. Pallone. Uh, do you own a gas stove? I do not own a gas stove, yes. Does it meet the new standards or not? You said half of the ones that exist do. And I do not do. know. You do not know? No. I know. Look, I, you know, I love you, but I, one of the points I'm trying to make here is that, you know, I don't, I'm not, I can't spend, maybe you can, and God bless you, but I can't spend all my time figuring out which, whether my stove meets the standards or not. I mean, I, I'm, I just have a lot to do with you know, I, I don't. I can't answer your question. I haven't checked the stove before I came here. I just haven't. I appreciate your honesty. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the question. I'm trying to figure out, does my stove... My understanding is this, and you cut me off if you want. My understanding is that he, these are proposed rules from the DOE that would take effect three years from when they're finalized, which they have not been, right? It doesn't affect any stove uh, that you have now at all, right? You don't have to change it. You don't have to throw it out. You can continue to use it. And I'm not disagreeing with what Mrs. Fishback and, and Mr. Rochenstiel has said that statements have been made, but that's not what's in the rule. Those are statements that were made, and people make statements. Maybe they shouldn't have, but there's nothing in the, the rule says three years from the finalization, and they put together certain efficiency standards for new stoves. So, New, newly manufactured stoves. I mean, when you burn a fuel in the presence of oxygen, it gives off a set amount of energy. I am trying to figure out how they make it more energy efficient. Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't answer that. What, I, what I'm concerned about as I read through the rules, they're just making the burners smaller, the biggest burner on the stove. Again. I mean, if you, if you put in a certain amount of gas, you're going to get a certain amount of heat out. There's not a whole lot you can do to change that. Uh, so I'm wondering, what's what's the difference? Uh, these are genuine, honest questions. Uh, I'm also wondering if you, you know, a lot of our electricity comes from natural gas plants. And uh, the 
the engineering tells you this, but just common sense would tell you this. You can burn the natural gas at a plant in a, in a turbine, you can spend some generators and generate electricity, ship it a, a couple hundred miles to somebody's house, and then you turn on electric element and try to generate heat from something that started as heat, went into electricity and came back to heat. That's gonna be a lot less efficient than burning the, ga the natural gas at the, at the house directly. I can just tell you, I, I don't know what the efficiency is, but it, it's not even gonna approach 50% efficiency. When you, when you try to turn something like natural gas into electricity and then ship it across, you know, uh, even if it's 20 miles, even if you're next door to the power plant, shifting forms of electricity to get back, shifting forms of energy, you're gonna lose something at every stage. So if this rule causes more people to buy electric stoves instead of gas stoves, they're gonna to have to burn more gas to create, to cook the same food. I mean, that's why I think uh, one of my colleagues here mentioned earlier that people who use natural gas, maybe you know this, uh, Mr. Duncan, they are, uh, they save money, don't they, over electric appliances and natural gas appliances? Yeah, there's no doubt. I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the cost savings is minuscule. And what- Or the rule, what, the, yeah, the rule yeah. cost savings. Yeah. So to comply, the manufacturers, to your point earlier, are basically removing some burners, so you have fewer burners on the gas appliance, and they would lower the heat. They would put a thermocoupler in there or something to lower the heat on that burner which means it's gonna take longer to cook. That means about the same amount of gas is probably burned to produce the same product, and that is the cooked food on the new gas stoves. And, you know, I'm interested to hear, very interested to hear that so many people have gas stoves in their home. But one of the things that the DOE points to is the air emissions and the air quality. But these are older stoves that they continue to have they're not concerned about their own air quality or they'd be doing something else. They'd be taking them out and putting electric stoves in today. In fact, they like the efficiency and the cost savings they get from a natural gas fired stove because it's efficient, it cooks their food in a timely manner, and it saves them money. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, I mean, it's, it's almost comical to me. I, I have, I'm sitting here reading the rule and I'm several dozens of pages into it. Uh, and maybe it has something to do with the pilot light as well, although there seems to be some existing rule on pilot lights already. But you can't get any more heat out of, you know, a certain amount of natural gas when you burn it. Uh, there, there are engines and motors, or engines, turbines that are more efficient than other engines and turbines. But when you just burn the flame, there's... I'm wondering if we're talking about efficiency here, or we're just talking about the size of the burner. Because if you're talking about the size of the burner, it's not about efficiency. Did you want to comment on that? Well, I, I just want to point out that there's nothing in this uh, proposed rule that's trying to get you to go to an electric stove. I mean, you still would have a gas stove, just making it more efficient. So I don't want to, again, I don't want to give the impression that the department's rulemaking is trying to tell people that you should use an electric stove. I mean, uh, the, Ms. Leisure Fernandez pointed out that people are going to continue to use gas for all kinds of reasons. They, they like the food, they like the product. We're not suggesting you move to electric. Well, um, I guess I need to know how this rule, the rule makes things more efficient. I, I couldn't answer that. that See, again, what you're doing, and I know you, you, I know, and I'm not criticizing you for it. It's you fine. want to substitute, you want to uh, look at all the details about what the department's doing and how they got to this stage and substitute your own analysis. That's fair. But I, I think that what this bill does is basically say that this department's not going to be able to do this now or in the future. And I think that's a mistake because if they don't have the expertise and they don't have the opportunity to do this, we're not going to be able to substitute our opinion for it each time. Maybe. Well, not, I, sorry to interrupt. I think I gave quite a bit of time. Uh, I don't want to substitute my opinion. I want to know the facts. I don't like, and so I'm just, I've asked factual questions. How does the rule make the appliance more efficient? Because then maybe we can figure out how it's going to make it more expensive. Uh, 
I mean, why are half of the appliances not in compliance or 96% or whoever's number you want to take? Is it, were they just bad engineers or were they actually making a product that people want and that, uh, that has a bigger burner? I don't know. We don't even know the answers to these things. If Congress doesn't know what the Department of Energy is doing or seeks to do with these rules, then we shouldn't let them do it. And, uh, yeah, Mr. Duncan. Well, I just want to point out that Congress passed the Energy Policy and Conservation Act to provide the Department of Energy with the authority to issue energy efficiency standards that, one, save a significant amount of energy, and two, are cost-effective for consumers. There's no study that shows this saves a significant amount of energy. And as, and, and I've, as I point out, there's no effective cost savings there for the consumer. If you, you think about this push for electrification by the, by the left, they really don't want that natural gas fired power plant to produce that electricity. They want it produced by wind and solar. It's some utopian mindset that there's going to be enough wind and solar to supplicate or re uh, replace the natural gas fired power plants that are out there. And it's not. It, the economics just don't add up. With land mass and, and available s sunlight during the day, uh, available wind energy. So this is a proposed rule that surely indicates and truly indicates that the Biden administration just has a war on natural gas because it is a fossil fuel. I think that's clear and simple. The, the longer you take to boil a pot of water, the longer that pot's hot and the more energy it loses to the environment. Like doing something and taking longer to do it when you're using heat generally results in less efficiency. So I, I, I mean, I'm gonna try to struggle through this to understand the science of it and the thermodynamics before we go to the floor tomorrow. But one, uh, back to the, uh, the committee work that you did, you said that it was bipartisan. Which, which bill is that? that you were Both of them. Both the bills before us are bipartisan. And in fact, the uh, gas stove ban was included in H.R. 1 and 29 Democrats voted in favor of it on the floor. So um, in the, you're saying you had co-sponsors? Had votes, votes in committee. And votes in committee. Democrats in your committee voted for this. That's correct. It passed bipartisan. Well, I think uh, we should have a bipartisan vote for this rule uh, tonight. I would hope we'd see that same spirit of bipartisanship, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. gentlemen. For, for, the, for the Rules Committee rule, not the, uh, <laughs> not the DOE rule. Gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for any questions he may have. Ms. Plone, have you ever seen an installation of a gas water heater or gas stove in a commercial building? Commercial building? Um, no, in my home, but not in the commercial building. The reason this is so serious, you are banning gas stoves. And here's how you're doing it. You're doing it through regulations. <clears throat> Whoever came up with this in the Biden administration needs to get in the field and look at it. Uh, what would you do when you get a call in the middle of the day on a <clears throat> on a uh, for a tenant who you, a transformer goes down, no electricity, and the lady, the la hair salon, the and we've had this experience. They don't have hot water, uh, and what's more, if it stays out to replace a transformer, it takes time, and. Um, what would you do when they demand their money back on the lease? What would I'm you do? Sure about has, I'm not sure. What is your question again? My question to you, if you've never seen the installation of a gas, any gas furnished now. Only in a home, not in a commercial building. Okay, commercial buildings, it it's happens everywhere. What this regulation does is makes it impossible to comply. Because I, I guarantee you what they're going to have is the exhaust system that they're going to put on the manufacturers. And you can't do it, particularly in a high-rise building that you've got multiple floors. I don't understand why you think that making these more efficient would necessarily do that. It's not, a, it's not efficient at all. The cost to do this, to refit a, an older building that's had gas, a restaurant on the third floor of a building. But again, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm asking you to just, you might want to, you're, you're talking as an expert on this. No, Let, I'm not an expert. Let me say this. My understanding is that this is with regard to new gas stoves that would be installed 
um, three years after the finalization of the rule. So I don't know why you would say that anything has to be retrofitted. You mean when you put in the new one, you'd have to retrofit what? You'd have to retrofit the building. And why would that necessarily be to the comply, case? To comply, you've got to retrofit it. And you don't have access. To, I mean, this is in real life. You, got, you don't have access to the building to do that. So it, it may, forces you to go with electricity, which is unreliable in a lot of cases. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to me that that would be the case. But again, I'm not an expert. Well, I promise you, if you look at it, I mean, go ask somebody that, that has got a 10-year-old building that's had gas stoves uh, in the building. And <clears throat> when they come, because I, I, we've seen it happen in other things. Well, the only thing I can assure you that it's not the intention to say that you can't use a gas stove in any situation and you have to move to electric. That's what I'm not saying the is, case. Uh, Ms. Plum, it is the intention, or either it's ignorance. Either they don't understand what they're, they're doing. This is very serious for your commercial buildings. To have to go in and retrofit to put a put a electric unit in because you can't comply with the gas because the the walls won't allow it. Can you imagine the cost of going? But back it's to not the intention to move to electric. It may not be the. That's what's so frustrating about this administration, Miss Plum. They're uh, they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand the mechanics of what they're asking the American people to do. It's not the role of government to do that. And if you ever just take a in your district, I'm sure. It, Go ask some, uh, you go ask some some tenants in commercial buildings, not so much residential. That's more, uh, well, it is a big deal with con condominiums, which are high rises, that they have gas stoves. To comply, it's going to, I saw somewhere it's $1,000. It's, it's, it's unbearable. It's the cost to retrofit it is going, they're going to throw their hands up. You can't do it. Uh, yeah, well, you can do it at a, at a price. That's like saying, price me a car that's uh, the driver is safe under any condition. Can you imagine the cost of that? You can design a car that the, uh, the driver is going to be safe. You can put enough steel in it. But what I'm saying, this, this thing has sent shockwaves through the commercial industry anyway. Because we have had, uh, when, when the power goes down, gas-fired units, both from a cooking side and from just the use, I mentioned a hair salon, that's actually happened. When the, when the electricity's down and uh, they wish they had had gas. But the ones that have it, to, uh, to come back and, and retrofit in buildings that are already existing. In a perfect world, you could design a building uh, that I guess would try to comply with, I hadn't seen the details of what they're gonna want to require, but just the thought of this is unbelievable. That, that they're doing this. To, to, but that's why the bells went off. I know in, in, uh, you talk to any commercial building, he'll tell you this is, this is tragic and it's unsustainable and it's, the cost of it would be uh, something that they would probably throw their hands up and say, when, I don't know what they would do. But look into the details of it and I think you would see in your district the cost to comply would be uh, something they just couldn't do. And I guarantee you, whatever cost savings it is, it's not going to be there. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy, is recognized for any questions he may have. I thank the chairman. Um, just a quick question for the gentleman from South Carolina. The two bills that we've got before us, one from Mr. Armstrong, one from Ms. Lesko, and all the various co-sponsors, to the best of my understanding, they are largely – prophylactic sort of preventing an overreach and then with certain kind of criteria, correct? In other words, prohibiting DOE from implementing conservation standards for kitchen ranges or ovens if the standards result in the unavailability of a product based on the type of fuel the product consumes, right? In other words, saying, hey, you're rattling a lot down there and you can say, oh, whatever, it was just a misspeak. Well, it's a misspeak by a federal official with an entire agency under that federal official saying, yeah, yeah, Maybe we'll ban gas stoves. So is not is it not true that the legislation in question has caveats about the reach of the purpose of the legislation, right? It's saying, hey, we want to do X in order to prevent Y. Is that not correct? Absolutely correct. And that's not true with both, both pieces of legislation, correct? That's correct. In other words, they would still allow, what for better or worse, by the way, different question. 
they would still allow regulators to regulate. They just wouldn't allow them to regulate such that the extreme happens, that consumers are unable to get the products that they want. That's correct. And so uh, I think that's kind of the, the question that I think is most important. And when I, the exchange uh, a minute ago with my friend from Kentucky um, about wanting to substitute our expertise, and we've had this exchange before here, and we just had it with respect to the RAINS Act, is my friend from South Carolina agree that the, the point here is about Congress saying, wait a second, like, no, this is like our fundamental job under Article One to go say, hey, bureaucrat, you were down there saying X, you're an expert, you're just God's gift to all things gas and energy and whatever, you're the genius, right? You're the one who knows everything. We bumpkins sitting out in our little farms in you know Texas or wherever, we're a bunch of idiots, we're all gonna die from stuff if you're not there protecting me. All those things. You're the genius. Are we not just saying, hold on a second, is there some check on the genius? Is there some check on whoever it is down there in the Department of Energy or whatever saying, hey, uh, Chip, you just can't have that gas-burning stove in your house that's been there since you've been alive. Uh, or, you know, the gas-fired stove that your grandfather cooked fried fish on, you know, for 80 years. You can't, you know, uh, uh, we don't want to have... Um, the ability in Congress to be able to check said bureaucrat if the bureaucrat wants to say, sorry, you may not be able to do that anymore? You're exactly right. I mean, we are a representative uh, republic. We all each represent 700 plus thousand people. And there's been a lot of pushback across this country about this proposed regulation. Proposed regulations ultimately become regulations without congressional pushback like we're seeing today. And so I believe that Congress is representing our constituents who raise the alarm over what appliances they may choose for their home. When there's no clear evidence that the appliances that administration is, they're not just nudging us that way, they're shoving us uh, in a certain direction, will be more efficient or more cost effective for the consumer. You know, the, as, as the gentleman from Kentucky said, you know, you're still going to burn just as much gas to heat a, a, a pot of water on a smaller burner as you did on a larger burner. You'll do it more time, and it's going to be less efficient. The cost savings are clear that they're not there. So I think you're right. We're pushing back against the administration because we don't have an oligarchy in this country. We don't have a small group of experts that tell a democratic republic like the United States of America, this is what you have to do. We have an elected Congress. Now, we did give the uh, administration through uh, a numerous piece of legislation passed before we got here, authority to do certain things. But that doesn't limit our ability to represent our constituents when they see this kind of overreach. Um, I would assume that my friend from South Carolina agrees. I know my friend from Kentucky and, and South Carolina up here agree, and maybe some others that this might be why it's wise to vote no on the vast majority of these pieces of legislation that empower uh, said bureaucrats and those down in the administration to do, well, frankly, just about anything at all, but in particular to be able to go down the road of possibly banning a, a consumer product that has been uh, being used by millions of Americans uh, every day for years. Um, I would, uh, quick question, the, part of the arguments, right, have to do with I don't know, internal health and asthma and so forth, because somebody did a study. But to the best of my understanding, that there's no uh, direct uh, correlation or, or um, understanding of some sort of causation there. I mean, you know, people have uh, asthma for all, uh, literally hundreds, thousands of different reasons. Um, is that not part of this issue that's being used? And then my question for you is actually more important is, do you think that's actually a ruse for what's really going on here, which is just a quest for the 100% electrification of America all in pursuit of a agenda? You're exactly right. I mean, as I pointed out earlier, those that, and, and I can name some Democrats on our committee that actually said they had gas stoves in their house, they like their stove, but they don't want the average American to have the same stove they have. Um, they like their stove if they're not concerned about the air quality because they're still using older appliances. And look, I think personally that we ought to be exporting more natural gas to help the quality of lives and improve air quality for folks that are using other things to heat their homes or cook their food on and, and have to cook it that day because they can't have um, 
appliances like refrigerators and sometimes propane powered refrigerators in rural areas that can actually keep food fresh. So this war on fossil fuels is trickling all the way down, uh, my gentleman from Texas, um, trickling all the way down to the American consumer who's having their choices limited by government that does not want to use fossil fuels in any shape, form, or fashion at some point in the future. So last question, I know we're trying to be mindful of time for votes. Um, is the gentleman uh, aware or does he agree in general with the following rough proposition that while we, this country, continue to pursue and chase the de-fossil uh, fuelification of this country um, through massive regulations that are making it impossible, if not, uh, I mean, really costly, if not impossible, to build fossil fuel generated power. That, that that was in fact the purpose of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. That that was in fact uh, the goal by the massive subsidization of the, uh, I'll call it unreliable energy uh, that is resulting in grids that are uh, not able to be relied upon by the American people to be sustained. And that while we're doing all of that, at the end of the day right now in China, for example, they are building two new coal-fired plants a week on top of the roughly 1,100 coal-fired plants they have in operation. And then we have about 250 coal-fired plants, gas-fired plants. But in Texas, for example, we're not building gas and coal-fired plants anymore because of the subsidies being put forward by the federal government. Would the gentleman agree that it is purposeful that the Inflation Reduction Act subsidies is designed with the specific intent of destroying fossil fuel-based energy and that as a result, the United States will be weaker in terms of national security, weaker in terms of grid reliability, weaker in terms of our ability economically to be in a position to export clean burning American natural gas. And that as that, that taken in totality, everything I just said, if the gentleman agrees that all of this, this stuff we're talking about here with gas stoves, this is just the ramifications all the way down to a person's kitchen of that same policy that the vast majority of the American people right now going about their daily life have no idea what their government is doing to them and their ability to afford energy and their ability to have human flourishing and exist on this planet that God gave us in a way that will amount to the best life for them and their children. Would the gentleman agree? If there's a number larger than 100%, I would agree with that number. So I'd say 100% agree with you. Thank you, gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you. Gentleman from New York, recognized for any questions he may have for the panel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, last winter, uh, Winter Storm Elliott hammered my district over Christmas, and my constituents dealt with life-threatening blackouts as the grid struggled to operate through such a massive uh, blizzard, uh, the worst blizzard in my entire lifetime. Uh, but one thing that my constituents could count on, despite the blackouts, was the use of their gas stoves. And in some, some instances, that was the only source of heat in the home uh, during a three-day uh, blizzard event. These were lifelines for people trapped in their homes during a storm that killed over 40 people in western New York. Uh, but the critical nature of these appliances couldn't stand in the way of my state's determination to make the pipe dreams of a Green New Deal a crushing reality for hardworking New Yorkers. Uh, our governor, not to be outdone by the Biden administration, she has marched ahead with a statewide phase out, also known as a ban of natural gas hookups in new residential and commercial buildings. Now, ignoring the historic efficiency and savings of natural gas that has brought New York and this entire country, for that matter, over the last 30 years, Democrats in my state are determined to force New Yorkers off of reliable, safe natural gas that's very plentiful uh, in, in my district uh, into an energy future that our own state's independent energy auditors uh, have said will be one with less affordable power in a less secure grid. Uh, Congressman Duncan, if... if DOE's proposed rule is finalized. What will happen to the gas stoves that no longer meet the efficiency standards? Well, the manufacturers are going to have to go back at a very costly um, process and try to meet the new standards proposed by the DOE. That tells me there's going to be fewer choices for our consumers. And to your point about the winter in New York, natural gas saved a lot of people. There's a war in New York and other states on natural gas. We've seen it in California. We've seen it in New York. And 
having the ability to cook when the power goes out, having the ability to cut the gas-fired logs on to heat the home when the power goes off, having hot water out of that Renai or whatever brand hot water heater you have that's gas-fired, having the ability to, to dry your wet clothes because you've been out there shoveling snow trying to get your car out so you can go to church or to work or whatever with a gas-fired uh, dryer. These are important things. And I'll tell you, the consumers wouldn't have them in their home if they weren't more efficient and save them money. That's why I have a gas hot water heater. That's why I have a gas dryer. So we see this continued war on fossil fuels taking so many forms. And here we are at the very, the very fundamental form in the kitchens of our homes where meals are prepared for families to sit around the table and eat together and discuss their day and do schoolwork. That's what this administration's going after. They're getting between the gas stove and the American consumer. Absolutely. This did not, uh, and thank you very much for that, this did not just magically appear one night. I mean, there is a comprehensive effort in this country to have a war on natural gas appliances and the use of natural gas. Um, among the number of consequences this rule would have on everyday Americans, it would prohibit the sale of many products already on the market. In, in other words, for those that struggle with the sim synonyms, it's a simple ban. Uh, this is a pattern within this administration's Department of Energy, raised efficiency standards, limiting ability of everything from cooking appliances to the technology needed to ensure that we can keep the lights on. And for those of you that insist that these aren't bans, all I have to say is I have a bridge to sell you. Uh, suddenly, Technology and equipment that was bought and sold one day is now forced out of circulation the next. And in the process, American families, American farms, and American businesses pay the price for tighter supply chains and even higher costs. Heating bills in New York State rose by 30% this past winter. And they'll continue to climb if we allow the Biden administration to further regulate Americans out of affordable energy in their future. And I strongly support these measures here today, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today, and the witnesses are excused. Thank you. I'd now I'd like to invite uh, Representative Moskowitz to the table. I guess we've got your trap back there. <laughs> Gentleman is recognized to present his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McGovern, members of the Rules Committee. I've offered several amendments today to H.R. 1615, the Gas Stove Protection and Freedom Act, and H.R. 1640, the Save Our Stoves Act. First, let me say that I don't think we should be banning gas stoves. I'm here to say I agree with that idea. And the good news is I don't think the rule bans gas stoves, but in the interest of time, let me briefly say a few words about each of these amendments and respectfully ask that the committee consider them in order. To start, my three amendments to H.R. 1640 provi provide common sense enhancements to reinforce the importance of this legislation because I, in some aspects, I don't think the bills go far enough. So Gen first- Gentlemen, let's suspend. Could conversation go on in the next room, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my amendment number one renames uh, the bill, H.R. 1640, to the Appliance Bill of Rights to put it on par with some of our most important rights as Americans, to show the American people that Congress is working and can tackle the hard issues for families across the nation. My amendment number two adds a sense of Congress on the value of our gas stoves, evidenced by the time that we've spent addressing this issue. Last week, we addressed the debt ceiling, which was critically important to our nation's fiscal stability and the world economy, the dollar's value over the yen. And just when Americans think that Congress can't handle the big issues, that we can't walk and chew gum at the same time, we're here to show them that we have the ability to do so by tackling the war on gas stoves. So in the spirit of doing that, obviously we have one, not just one, but two gas stove bills. So my second amendment uh, would give gas stoves, I think the honor that they deserve, uh, you know, a stainless steel, six burner double oven in statuary hall. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we have statues there that are made of marble and bronze, but we don't have anything of stainless steel 
And so I think this could be uh, the first one. Amendment number three helps ensure that the hours of hard work uh, do not go by the wayside on this issue. And so I propose creating a position in the U.S. Department of Energy for the sole purpose of fighting the war on gas stoves. This amendment would create this position in the department, the Supreme Allied Gas Commander, a position that young boys and girls can one day aspire to, just as they're sitting in class, maybe reading a book, hopefully a book that wasn't banned, or sitting in class, hopefully being safe, they could, they could think about being uh, one day the Supreme Allied Gas Commander. Now switching over to H.R. 1615, this amendment honors, uh, uh, honors this amendment by also changing its name to Make Appliances Great Again. Many of you already have the hats and shirts and flags and boats, so I figured we would just make it easy uh, so that you could show uh, your support uh, for this amendment. And if you don't like that slogan, because that, you know, something of four years ago, uh, we can, my last amendment, uh, uh, my second amendment on that one changes the name uh, to uh, Sto Stoves Over Gun Violence Act. In 2020, there were more than 40 million gas stoves, which is only about 10% of the amount of guns uh, that are on the streets. And so uh, I, I thought that maybe we could show parents really what our priority is, which is stoves uh, over gun violence. And finally, Mr. Chairman, Amendment Number 5 to H.R. 1615, uh, to kind of put us back on the right track, is uh, this amendment uh, would, would, would take all the funds that are being used for the purpose of uh, this gas stove thing and redirect them uh, for gun violence uh, prevention efforts. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate uh, the committee considering my amendments. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Chair has no questions. Uh, move to the distinguished vice chair. No questions. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for questions. Gentlelady from Minnesota? No. Are there any questions? The remainder of the Republican side? Gentlelady from New Mexico? Thank you so much, Representative Gentleman's excused. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who can testify on H.R. 277, H.R. 288, H.R. 1615, or H.R. 1640? Seeing none, yes, ma'am. I would just ask unanimous consent to submit the statement from Representative Sheila Jackson Lee on her amendment. Without objection. Uh, seeing none, this concludes the hearing portion, uh, closes the hearing portion. Uh, without objection, the committee stands in recess. Uh, until 6.30 p.m. We may come back earlier. We will try and let you know. 6.30 should go pretty quickly. Stand and recess.
exactly what he needs to read. We'll be counting in a moment. One, two, three, four. I, I don't see the purpose of doing that. What is the, yeah, what is substantially? What does that do for us? Ogle's amendment. Uh, I think it just expands the scope of the bill because otherwise, like, I don't think substantially is defined in the bill. So you're right. Uh, and so I think it just kind of muddles the areas of what substantially is trying to mean. And so just kind of just to get, am I wrong? I don't know, but if he just removed the word. So it broadens, it, it right now the bill has a narrower definition of what a, a rule that would be prohibited on this topic would be. By striking substantially, it basically makes it harder for them to do anything in this area. Do you, know, do you know that scene in old school when Will Ferrell gives like this really like cogent, like very eloquent answer? Says, like, I'm sorry, I just out. blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish he'd come and presented his amendment so we could understand it better. I think we want to get as not as many people on their testimony for amendments as possible, seeing as that we are in a tight timeline here. We are? Always. We're always on a tight timeline. Yes. Yes. Do you want to go home? I just got here. <laughs> Chairman's got a very big thing at uh, seven. Oh, okay. Is it baseball viewing party? Softball? No, no softball's over. We won. Boomer, won. Boomer Sooner. They Boomer won. Sooner. Circle the wagons. We were trying to break them earlier. Seems like now. Why is it such a big softball? I think it's just name all the state universities in Oklahoma. Yeah. Like there's no like bowling green of Oklahoma. Like Ohio's got bowling green. Like Oral, of, like, Oral Roberts? Is that in Oklahoma? I think so. Isn't it Dalton? It is. No, it's a religious school though. There's got to be another like land grant school in Oklahoma besides Oklahoma State. No. No? It's only one? Enough.
down there. Let's see if any of them are in here. This is very Yours interesting. Yours is on. Chair will be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 277, the Reigns Act of 2023, a structured rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their respective designees. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of text of rules committee print 118-6 shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule further makes in order only those amendments printed in part A of the rules committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent, and an opponent shall not be subject to amendment. 
and shall not be subject to demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against the amendments printed in Part A of the report are waived. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of H.R. 288, the Separation of Powers Restoration Act of 2023 under a structured rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of the Rules Committee print 118-7 shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their respective designees. The rule further makes in order only the amendment printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. All points of order against the amendment printed in Part B of the report are waived. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of H.R. 1615, the Gas Stove Protection and Freedom Act, under a structured rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and the ranking minority member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce or the respective designees. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule further makes in order only those amendments printed in Part C of the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against the amendments printed in Part C of the report are waived. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of H.R. 1640, the Save Our Gas Stoves Act, under a structured rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce or the respective designees. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule further makes in order only those amendments printed in Part D of the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against the amendments printed in Part D of the report are waived. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit. Thank you very much. You've now heard the motions. Are there any discussion or amendment to the rule? The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make in order amendment number eight to H.R. 1615 offered by Representative Wilson, which ensures that the Consumer Product Safety Commission can protect children from any risk of in respiratory injury caused by gas stoves. This amendment would simply guarantee that the commission can still impose standards or rules to protect American children from the risk of a respiratory injury. I think we should all be able to agree that safeguarding the well-being of children is vital and that the Commission's ability to carry out this vital mission shouldn't be blocked. So I'd urge a, a yes vote on this mission. Is there any further discussion of the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Yeah. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Request a recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess? No. Mr. Reschenthaler? No. Mr. Reschenthaler? No. Ms. Fishbach? No. Mrs. Fishbach? No. Mr. Massey? No. Mr. Massey? No. Mr. Norman? Mr. Roy? No. Mr. Roy? No. Mrs. Houchin? No. Mrs. Houchin? No. Mr. Langworthy? No. Mr. Langworthy? No. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Ms. Scanlon? Aye. Ms. Scanlon? Aye. Mr. Nagoose? Aye. Mr. Nagoose? Aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez? For the children, aye. Uh, Ms. Ledger Fernandez? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Uh, four yeas, eight nays. Noes have it, and the amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I have another amendment. Gentle ladies, gentle ladies recognized. 
I have an amendment to the rule. I would move that the committee make an order amendment number seven to HR 1615 offered by Representative Moore, which prevents the bill from restricting the ability of the Consumer Product Safety Commission to conduct studies on the impact of products on children's health. Based on the last vote, apparently, uh, the majority doesn't believe the commission should be able to impose rules to protect children's respiratory health. I disagree, but I recognize we're in the minority here. This amendment would simply ensure that the commission can study the impact of consumer products on children's health. This shouldn't be controversial. I urge a yes vote on my motion, and I yield back. Is there any further discussion of the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment's not agreed to. I'd request a recorded vote. A recorded vote's been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Reschenthaler. No. Mr. Reschenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. Aye. Mr. Nagoose, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Uh, four ayes, eight nays. Amendment, amendments not agreed to. Any further amendments? Mr. Chairman. General lady from New Mexico is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the move. I move the committee make an order amendment number 12 to H.R. 277 offered by Ms. Plaskett, which allows an exemption for rules to provide benefits or health services to veterans under laws administered by the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. We all know that Congress often cannot act and cannot act timely, and we also know that we must not let this bill slow down the implementation of helpful rules that provide health care and benefits to our nation's veterans. Uh, we must not only thank veterans for their service, but we must make sure that we provide them the, the services they deserve. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in, fa uh, in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Request a recorded vote. Recorded vote's been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Reschenthaler. No. Mr. Reschenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mrs. Scanlon. Aye. Mrs. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. Aye. Mr. Nagoose, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. For our veterans, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendments not agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Seeing none, the vote. Hearing none, uh, the um, vote is uh, on the question on the motion to report. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The chair ayes for recorded vote. Recorded vote's been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey, aye. Mr. Norman. Aye. Mr. Norman, aye. Mr. Roy. Mr. Nor Mr. Roy, aye. Mrs. Houchin. Aye. Mrs. Houchin, aye. Mr. Langworthy. Aye. Mr. Langworthy, aye. Mr. McGovern. Uh, no. Mr. McGovern, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Nagoose. No. Mr. Nagoose, no. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. No. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, four days. And the ayes have it. The motion to report is agreed to. Accordingly, Mr. Massey will be managing the rule for the majority. And Ms. Scanlon will uh, manage it for the Democrats. Very good. Without objection, the committee is adjourned.
a Russian man claiming to hold top-level secrets about Russian advanced bombers has just turned up at the U.S. southern border, seeking asylum. The man claims to have been an engineer at a production facility over in the city of Kazan, and he says that he possesses top-secret information about the White Swan Tu-160, which is the most advanced bomber in the Russian arsenal. U.S. border officials, they interviewed the man, and they determined that his story was in fact credible and eventually passed him off to the FBI, who are still in the process of interrogating him right now. However, analysts have pointed out that the fact that the story was even leaked to the public is an indication that perhaps the American government is encouraging other Russians who also hold top-level secrets to also escape to America. And if you thought that was interesting, well then you should click on that button below this video and check out Epic TV, one of the best no-censorship video platforms on the internet.